The Wait for That Jobs Report, live from a dark studio, too, here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York. I'm Romaine Boston. And I'm Scarlett Food. Let's kick you off to the closing bell here in the United States. All right, the S&P 500 clawing its way back, clinging on to its first gain of the new year. So it is on track. Do we have the screen up? to end uh, a three-day decline. There we go. See, up by one-tenth of one percent. U.S. Treasuries are under pressure right now, pushing yields up across the curve. You had private jobs data that showed U.S. companies continue to hire last month, uh, raising the stakes for tomorrow's big jobs report. And of course, the Fed's timeline for eventually starting to cut interest rates. You can see the 10-year yield still below that four percent level at the moment. The yen is weakening against all the major currencies at the moment. On speculation, it'll be difficult for the Bank of Japan to exit its negative interest rate. Uh, policy following the earthquake earlier this year. And we're looking at New York crude down by two-thirds of 1%, pairing some of its losses. This is after domestic stockpiles rose to a six-month high remain. We're going to talk a lot today, of course, about what's going on in crude, what's going on in, co- in currencies, but also we're going to talk a lot about what's going on in the job market because the trajectory of the labor market, and more precisely, the trajectory of wage growth, that is the focus ahead of that big monthly jobs report scheduled to come out Friday morning. A trickle of advanced data coming out today that includes from ADP, which showed private payroll increasing the most since August. Good. A separate government report showing weekly applications for unemployment insurance falling to the lowest level since October. Also good. And then there was that Challenger Gray and Christmas report that showed a labor market cooling, but largely coming in the form of weaker hiring instead of actual job cuts. You put it all together, and while it does suggest economic resiliency, it does not provide a backdrop to justify five or six rate cuts for this year, at least not yet. The jobs data nudging Treasury yields higher as some investors really confronting that reality. Fed funds rate, the swaps trade, also suggesting a tempering of rate cut expectations. Now, the swaps market pricing in about 140 basis points of cuts. Remember, just yesterday they were pricing in 145, so a modest tempering of expectations, but one to keep an eye on. The net effect of all of this is basically, well, you have an equity market right now that remains mired in a great deal of uncertainty. In fact, the NASDAQ 100 today, that was a world beater last year. It looks like getting beat up today, down for a fifth straight day. That's the longest losing streak that we've seen on the index, believe it or not. Going back to late 2022, 80 of the NASDAQ 100 companies over that five-day stretch are in the red. That includes 5% drops for Amazon and Apple, about an 8% drop out there for some of the other names like Tesla, and a 10% drop, Scarlet Foo, on names like NXP Semi, and we're going to talk about a little bit later, Walgreens. Yeah, so here's another way of looking at how what was once the U.S. market's strength, big tech, has now become a significant drag. This is the Magnificent 7 plus three other chip names we're talking about, Broadcom, AMD, and Intel. They make up the biggest losers by market cap over the past week. You can see Apple shed getting $140 billion almost uh, in market value, Tesla losing about $73 billion. Altogether, these bottom 10 have seen more than $400 billion in equity value wiped out in a week. Now, this rotation out of big tech really picked up steam in the past week, but you can actually see that There were signs of this starting in late October because that was when the 10-year yield peaked on an intraday basis on October 23rd. Thanks, by the way, to Chris Verone of Strategas for pointing all of this out. The equal weight S&P 500, that is the white line there, has, uh, you know, of course, all the 500 companies influencing the index in the same way. Mohawk Industries has the same weighting as Microsoft. It has handily outperformed the Magnificent 7, which is the blue line, to the tune of more than four percentage points for Maine. All right, let's kick things off to the close here on this Thursday afternoon with Brian Levitt. He's Invesco's global market strategist joining us here in Studio 2. Brian, great to see you here. I don't know if we can still say Happy New Year or not. Happy New Year. My <laughs> wife told me last night I said it way too much. But I'm going to say it again. Happy New Year. One more um, week. I think, yeah, I think we get another couple days. I, I am curious, though. I mean, Scarlett had that chart up. And as you know, 2023 was really dominated by those big cap stocks. But we saw towards the end of the year a little bit of an embrace of some of the small caps, some of the cyclicals. And I know that's been a little disjointed over the last couple of days. But do you see maybe a little bit more appetite to go down the ladder a bit in terms of market cap? Yeah, we do. I mean, what we yeah. what we had was an environment where interest rates were, were moving up. Um, you had a deep inversion of the yield curve and you had investors looking for larger cap, mega cap quality names Mm -hmm. versus now what we're looking ahead towards and what the market is focusing on is an easing cycle and the renormalization of the yield curve. Historically, that has 
benefited a broader array of names within the broad indices, more value oriented, more small cap. So it's not surprising the way the market's been behaving. Is this though, that trade, is this simply to kind of that catch up, the idea that some of these names are so beaten down or are people really looking at some of these companies in that small cap space and actually finding fundamental value? The idea here that, yeah, you can buy into something that maybe isn't as profitable or as growthy as some of those other names, but they will catch up? Yeah, I mean, there's fundamental value, but just because something is reasonably priced doesn't mean it's not going to stay reasonably priced. It requires a catalyst. Mm -hmm. And so when you look around the world, we've all known for a while now that mega cap U.S. stocks are trading above their long term averages versus small cap, which are not value oriented, which aren't um, and international stocks, which haven't been. But again, it requires a catalyst. And what investors are looking ahead to is a catalyst in the form of stable growth, inflation being behind us and the Federal Reserve that's easing. Okay, so you're describing macro conditions. Mm -hmm. Will earnings provide any kind of catalyst? I mean, will any of these companies, uh, the CEOs of these smaller cap companies, say anything that'll get investors excited enough? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot lot of what you hear from these companies is that demand still remains quite sound. I mean, the reason for valuations being increasingly attractive was because investors, a lot of investors thought we'd be in a recession by now. A lot of thought credit spreads would have blown out and smaller capitalization names would would have seen demand erode significantly. That's not the backdrop that we're in. It's still a, you know, maybe below trend, but still a stable growth environment, enough growth to be supportive for corporate earnings. I hear a lot about how it's time maybe to expand beyond the U.S. market Mm -hmm. and look at international markets. Mm -hmm. So it's curious that there are people saying, you know, maybe it's time to look at small caps, which are definitely more leveraged to the U.S. domestic market and also look abroad to international markets. How do you square that? Yeah, it's a risk on trade. You know, in essence, if you think it's an economy that's going to continue to persist in this reasonably Goldilocks soft landing environment, then you want to broaden your exposure to where valuations are more attractive. So that's in smaller cap. That's in international. And it all kind of works on the same play in that if the Fed's done raising rates, typically that starts to take some of the steam out of the U.S. dollar. The Fed starts to normalize that yield curve. Again, historically, smaller caps and international have performed well. You need catalysts. And what we're looking for is, you know, leading indicators in Europe, leading indicators in China, which have been quite depressed, actually look like they're starting to turn a bit at a time when the dollars come off the boil. So it's 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 all lining up for it now. The one caveat is we got a lot of good returns quickly yeah. at the end of the year, and so yeah. we'll we'll need the next catalyst. That gets to the, to the question though, as to whether that really was kind of a pull forward. That was kind of the fear that effectively people were kind of taking some of the gains that maybe we should have been stretched out for a little bit longer. Or is that the wrong way to look at it? Well, I think if you want to look at it very short term, there's something of that going on. But if you want to look at it over the next few years. I think investors should look beyond minute to minute and look over a, you know, yeah. a, a few quarters or beyond. But the Market- minute to minute is so exciting. It is very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> but, and we should point out the minute to minute ends up making up the year. It does. Know? You but, just have to put it all together. But markets tend to do very well yeah. in the years after inflation has peaked. And that was over a year ago. Policy tightening has peaked. Interest rates have peaked. Mm-hmm. And so that has been the story. If you think back to when inflation peaked in June 2022, we've done very well in mm-hmm. the subsequent year and beyond. Um, similarly, we would expect a similar story with, with policy tightening, with the peak in interest rates. Could you have some challenges along the way? Yeah, sure, yeah. there'll be some challenges. Mm-hmm. And maybe we did pull out forward some of those returns yeah. quickly. But over the intermediate term time period should be a good backdrop for risk assets. So, uh, uh, all right, well, I think uh, we're out of time here, Brian. Uh, <laughs> I, I had a lot more questions, because I do wonder if the Fed is really going to be out of the way, like some people think. I wanted to ask you about that. I wanted to ask you about about some of the geopolitical issues. Next time. And I wanted to get your thoughts here on whether your Michigan Wolverines Ooh. are going to finally succumb. I think we are. To the, really? I think we're going to win. Huh? You know what? He we, said succumb. You he were said like, succumb. No, no, yeah. Oh. Yeah, no, no. We're going we're to win. We're not succumbing to anything. All right. Well, the pride of the University of Michigan and, of course, uh, uh, global market strategist over at Invesco, Brian Levitt, helping us kick things off to the close here on this Thursday afternoon. Coming up, a sit down with Michelle Meyer, the chief economist over at the MasterCard Economics Institute. Her insight on consumer spending, the economic outlook for the year, and that big jobs report tomorrow. Plus, the tensions in the Red Sea are causing a rise in global spot container rates. We're going to have the latest on what it means for supply chains and uh, inflation. 
And we're going to get some insight into the business of college football. It is big business, in case you heard. It's a big game coming up on Monday here. We're going to sit down with George Pine. He's a founder and CEO of Bruin Capital to talk about the economics behind the big game and whether some of those folks on the screen deserve a little bit more of a cut. All that more coming up in a second on The Close right here on Bloomberg. The jobs report last month beat estimates. That is a stunning number. That is what nobody was expecting. The bullish train has left the station. This is what Powell does not want to see. This Friday, Tom, Jonathan, Lisa, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. You're really not seeing the level of restrictiveness show up yet in the labor market. Significant job growth and high labor force participation. There's a very strong chance that the market is mispriced for 2024. The December jobs report, Friday on Bloomberg Television and Radio. T minus one to the monthly U.S. jobs report. Let's get a preview now and check in with Abigail Doolittle. And it could be a big one, Scarlett, given the fact that it is one of the data points that will, of course, go into the Fed's decision making around whether or not to start cutting rates in March. And uh, relative to expectations for the December jobs report due out tomorrow at 8.30 a.m., the consensus is uh, flipping between 171 and 170,000 jobs added. Last month, uh, the month of November, was 199. So kind of right right in line. Now, one reason to think that it could come in in line or even slightly above jobless claims fell for the final week of December. That's not in that payrolls report, but just the trajectory. We also had that ADP report came, coming in a bit hot, uh, that m- more so than expected. 164,000 jobs were added. The consensus had been for 125. And in November, it was 103. And then we also, of course, were just talking about the idea that this will be a really important point for uh, the Fed. Now, relative to December and how they stack up recently for the number of jobs added. Let's take a look at what we've had going on. And so the number uh, now it actually is actually ticked up to 174. That's kind of in the sweet spot of most of these jobs that we've had added in the month of do- no- November going back a number of years. You can see that p- the pandemic low of 2020 and then the high of 2021, sort of the outliers. Let's see whether or not we get that Goldilocks report. And then returning to that idea of whether or not the ADP report that came came in uh, better than expected. Is that any kind of tell on uh, the non-farm payrolls? Probably not, but we can see uh, where we're at in general. So in what we're looking at in white is the ADP report uh, going back many, many months. In blue, we're looking at the non-farm payrolls report. So there's uh, the 199 of uh, last month, November. Here's the 164 that was just added. So again, we're looking remain for 174, kind of right in this Goldilocks area, that question of uh, will it be too hot or too light? If yeah. it land somewhere in here, it'll probably be okay. But a real outlier? Well, maybe tomorrow will be volatile. Those numbers coming out 8.30 a.m. Washington time. Tomorrow morning, team surveillance will have full coverage as it drops, but the full context that you need, it happens right now. Michelle Meyer, chief economist over at the MasterCard Economics Institute, joining us to talk a little bit more, less about, I guess, some of the day-to-day stuff. And Michelle, really want to get your take, I guess, on kind of the broader outlook for 2024. And I guess at the core of that outlook, certainly here in the U.S., has to do with your view on the labor market and whether it is indeed still healthy. Absolutely, remain. So um, the MasterCard Economics Institute, we just published a big outlook piece where we released our views for 2024, and it's, it's still very positive. And that's an, it's an economy in the U.S. that's continuing to expand. The business cycle has room left to go, but it is a business cycle that's evolving. And that's really important to keep in mind that You know, we are seeing inflation continue to moderate. So that means overall nominal consumer spending or nominal GDP growth will be continuing um, to see some some slowing into something that's more sustainable relative to the growth rates we had over the prior few years. Mm -hmm. Um, And the labor market is critical in that perspective, which is that throughout 2023, the labor market beat expectations. We saw very healthy job creation, as Abigail just showed in the charts before, an unemployment rate that stuck at low levels, and therefore wage growth that has continued to run at a rate above what would be considered trend growth. And Mm -hmm. that's been a very big support for consumers and um, boosting their purchasing power. Of course, all the discussion right now is how do you sort of, I guess, contain some of that growth in the labor market in a constructive way to keep inflation 
uh, to actually we'll bring it back down to that 2% target here. And we know there's been a big focus on wage growth. It's kind of interesting, though, when you hear some of the comments that we heard out of Powell, as well as some of the other policymakers, this idea that they actually think we're a lot closer to getting there, primarily because they see a trend line in wages that is working in their favor. I'm not sure I see that in my economic data, but I'm not an economist. You are. Do you see that? Yeah. So, you know, the Federal Reserve is setting um, policy not off of what's happening right now, but really what's off of what will happen, the expectation, because monetary policy works with, as they always say, long and variable lag. So when you look at the trend, wage growth is still quite elevated, but it has started to decelerate. Um, and that has come with some of the other more early indicators in the labor market showing some uh, slowing and churn in the workforce. Look at the JOLT survey that was just released. We did see some drop in the quit rate, some drop in, in job opening rates. So it's still healthy. It's still showing job creation, but it's not as red hot as it was this time last year. So from a Fed's perspective, that makes them more comfortable starting to think about the possibility of removing some of the tightness of monetary monetary policy and beginning to see um, a path towards cutting interest rates if you anticipate that we will further see wage growth slow and therefore mm. that will solidify this downward trend in inflation. Of course, another input to inflation is oil prices. And um, I think about what's happening in the Middle East, uh, the attacks in the Red Sea and increased shipping rates as a result. How big a threat is that to the disinflation narrative? Because it's an exogenous shock, and I know the Fed pays attention to core, which strips out um, food prices and oil prices, but these things have a way of seeping into the, the rest of the economy. They certainly do, and we have to pay a lot of attention to these external forces, even if they're virtually impossible <laughs> to forecast. Um, so yes, the Fed pays attention to core, pays attention to those underlying measures of inflation that are going to be dictated by the tightness in the real economy. But to the extent to which we do have an upward oil price shock, it could matter through expectations in particular, inflation expectations and consumer expectations. Um, people are very sensitive to how much they're paying at the pump. They pay a lot of attention to those regular purchases and what prices are doing for that. So it is something we certainly have to monitor. The Federal Reserve is obviously paying very close attention to, but it's very hard to forecast. And it's very hard to set forward policy based off of these exogenous factors. So I think for the moment, the, the, the main attention will be on those dynamics in the real economy that mm -hmm. should have a better appreciation for what will come from the path forward for inflation and therefore monetary policy. In, in terms of drivers for the economy, consumer spending, the huge part of, uh, at least in the United States, and we talk about how the consumer, when they're feeling confident, they will spend, but I think it's been pretty clearly established that even when consumers are anxious, they will spend, maybe they just spend a little differently. What do we know about how companies and enterprises spend when things are uncertain and that uncertainty is likely to increase? Well, you know, I would argue that throughout this whole cycle, there's been heightened uncertainty because of the nature of this past recession. It was a highly unusual one driven by the pandemic um, that was then matched by extraordinary amounts of monetary and fiscal stimulus. So this has been a very unusual time for consumers and for businesses alike, which means that I think there has been a level of caution that we've experienced over the last few years. We have not really seen overinvestment or too much inventory build or you know intentional inventory build. Um, and similarly, when you look at consumers and you think about their balance sheet, it's remained very solid and healthy as well. So I don't anticipate that it's gonna be very different this year from a, mm. um, an uncertainty shock perspective than it has been the past few years where companies have really been operating in an environment where there are a lot of unknowns and they've been somewhat cautious in that sense. Yeah, well, the consumer will continue spending and companies will continue to deal with the known unknowns. Michelle, really appreciate your time. Michelle Meyer is Chief Economist and Head of the Economics Institute over at MasterCard Economics Institute. Coming up, we've got shares of Mobileye plunging as the self-driving technology firm releases its full-year revenue forecast. What is the ripple effect on the rest of the semiconductor sector? This is The Close on Bloomberg.
Welcome back to the close of Focus on the Markets and a focus on some of the big individual movers out there. Mobileye, one of the biggest decliners today, plunging after the self-driving technology company released a full-year revenue forecast that came in well short of Wall Street estimates. Uh, Bloomberg Technology co-host Ed Ludlow joining us right now from San Francisco. Talk a little bit more about what's going on. We should point out, Ed, this is a behemoth of a company. It's Israel's most valuable publicly traded company. Uh, Last time I checked, it was still a key player in the autonomous driving revolution, if you will. Uh, But there's a speed bump, apparently, that's taking place right now. Explain to us what's actually happening. It's a reality check about the end markets, which is the automotive sector. Right, the revenue outlook for 24 of 1.83 billion to 1.96 billion, even at the high end, is significantly below Wall Street expectations of 2.5 billion dollars for 24. And the story is really clear. Mobileye makes the chips or systems that go into advanced driver assistance features on a car and, and at the low end of autonomous technology. And in that market, After the supply crunch of 2020, lots of the tier one suppliers and automakers bought up as many of those chips as they could, but now they've got big inventories to work through. So simply put, they've stopped ordering. And that manifests itself in what Mobileye sees as being a 50, 50% drop in sales year on year in the first quarter of this year. It's a pretty um, eye-popping number there. So this has less to do with what automakers see as the road ahead and more to do with just cleaning up their inventory and how they manage it. Is that right? Yeah, there's two parts to it. So on a a consumer car, you have the sensor suites that make up uh, ADAS, this advanced driver assistance. Think about the cameras and sensors that help you stay in the lane and lower functionality like that. And at the upper end of the market, some lower level autonomy. The tier ones are the ones that make the -the off-the-shelf components, and they're really the bottleneck here. They bought way too many chips as a knee-jerk reaction. But we also know in the context of electric vehicles, for example, that Ford has cut its production outlook for this year. Many others have too. So downstream, they've stopped ordering those components as well. And it's not just mobile. I think about um, analog devices, Texas Instruments, NXP. They spent ages telling us that the automotive sector had bottomed out. But now they too are revising their outlook because those end markets, there just isn't the demand. In, in a, and it's kind of like a, 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 a famine to feast scenario, right? Everyone yeah. was so anxious about the supply crunch that they now ended up with a large glut of these automotive chips. Yeah, absolutely here. And it's interesting to see the share reaction as investors come to terms with it. Uh, Ed Ludlow, you can catch him every day here as co-host of Bloomberg Technology right here on this network. A closer look at mobilized shares down 26 percent here on the day. And we should point out that that's the biggest drop it's ever had, yeah. though. We should point out it's had a relatively short history as a public company uh, just going public in twenty. But I look at the ripple effect and the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, which has 30 members, 27 of them are down with Allegro Microsystems off by more than 7 percent. Only NVIDIA, AMD and Micron, some of the AI related names are uh, bucking the decline. This could actually prove to be one of the bigger stories of 2024 as it unfolds the EV revolution, the autonomous driving revolution, and all of the parts and the stocks that feed into that. Stick with us. We'll be back with more coverage right here on The Close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close, just about 2.30 here in New York, with stocks mixed here on the day, coming off two pretty severe days of losses. Meanwhile, let's check in on the commodity space because we continue to see oscillations there, particularly in the energy market. Abigail Doolittle, she's standing by with our commodities close. Yeah, it's looking a little heavy again today, Romaine. Take a look at New York crude. I shouldn't say again because we, of course, have had a couple updates this week. But New York crude today down about three quarters of one percent. And inventories for crude came in uh, below expected, so that would be a positive. But for gasoline, uh, they surged. I think there's a little bit of a sympathy trade here, but you can see that gasoline clearly down more. Copper down four tenths of one percent. And it's interesting because nickel is down more, down two percent. So these industrial metals, I think copper, a little bit of a sympathy trade to nickel. And then soybeans also lower down about eight tenths of one percent, although off the lows. And I've been talking in recent weeks about the rains in Brazil. Apparently it's raining a lot there again, which means a better crop for soybeans, more supply. Traders don't like it. So we have some weakness for the grains. All right, a nice wrap up there by Abigail. What's going on in the commodity space when we talk about those grains and we talk about those energies? Of course, those things have to be transported across the globe. And, well, the cost to do that has been rising. Global spot container rates soaring as much as 173 percent 
on reduced capacity caused by the threats to cargo vessels in the Red Sea. We should point out that 173 percent jump is just over the last couple of weeks. Lee Glasgow joining us right now over at Bloomberg Intelligence to discuss some of these numbers. And Lee, I remember kind of early in the pandemic, we were all so obsessed with like these container shipping rates, which of course just went through the roof here. Are we going to see a repeat of that in terms of the levels that they reached back in 2020 and 2021? I don't think so, because we're, we're well below those rates today. The, the peaks that we saw during the pandemic uh, were about like 70% uh, still below that. Rates are just moving above break-even levels for a lot of operators. So while it's staggering numbers that you're seeing rates going up 200% over the last two weeks, uh, to take, put that in context, you know, the, one of the largest uh, uh, liners out there, Maersk, uh, probably will still lose money in the first quarter. Obviously, the biggest... Um, driver will be how long the issue in the Red Sea uh, lasts. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on what, you know, other governments are going to be do to protect uh, global trade. I'm sure, as you know, about 12 percent of global trade goes through the Suez Canal. Mm -hmm. um, so not only are, you know, are, are, is the U.S. Uh, and Europe interested in making sure that the Suez Canal is open and free, yeah. uh, but also, um, you know, most economies around the world. Yeah. Well, at least for right now, we know it's not open and free. You combine that with uh, disruptions, climate related disruptions in the Panama Canal. And we've talked so much about how these global shippers have had to find alternative routes, routes that take longer, routes that are more expensive. Is that going to basically be the story for much of this year? Or do you see the potential for some of this normalizing? I personally think it's going to normalize. I mean, you know, I'm hoping that you know, what we're seeing in the Red Sea doesn't uh, doesn't last, uh, um, you know, through the whole year. I hope it's a weeks or a month kind of kind of issue and, and things resume. And the reality is, there's just a lot of structural challenges within the container liner uh, market. Uh, supply growth, so the amount of uh, capacity that's coming onto the water, is supposed to grow at a rate twice that of what demand growth is, and that's going into what was already a depressed rate environment before mm. uh, this whole fiasco in the Red Sea. Yeah, you mentioned maybe it'll be resolved in a month or so. Um, next month, of course, is the Lunar New Year, and there's going to be a lot of congestion, I'm guessing, before that. Uh, China, you know, wanting to make sure that things are in place. Talk a little bit about that timeline and how that contributes to congestion in the Red Sea and what the likes of Maersk and Mitsui need to do. Yeah, a lot of factories uh, in and around Asia try to uh, push their product out before the, uh, the the Lunar New Year so their folks can go home and go on vacation. Uh, and so there's usually a rush of demand. Uh, obviously, what's happening in the Red Sea, and as you mentioned, what's happening in the Panama Canal is really choking or uh, absorbing a lot of the slack capacity that's out there because of the longer times that these ships are taking to go uh, to deliver whatever goods they have. You know, to go around Africa can, ten, can take anywhere between 10 to 12 extra days uh, versus going through the Suez Canal. So that's going to eat up in capacity and that's going to keep rates high probably, you know, as you mentioned, probably, you know, until the Lunar uh, New Year, assuming there's not a really major change going on uh, in the Middle East. Yeah, never, uh, never count on anything happening on that front because uh, there's so many structural issues there. Lee, really appreciate your joining us. Uh, Lee Clasco of Bloomberg Intelligence uh, covers shipping and the like, uh, the likes of that. Still ahead on the close, despite sales and earnings per share topping estimates, we're looking at shares of Walgreen falling today. Why is that? We'll discuss. That is our stock of the hour. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls. The big movers on the back of analyst recommendations, and we start off with the big one, Apple. Piper Sandler giving the iPhone maker its second downgrade this week alone, cutting to neutral from overweight with the analysts saying growth rates have peaked for smartphones worldwide with China's economic struggles weighing heavily on iPhone demand. Apple shares down for another day here, nine-tenths of a percent. Next up, let's take a look at Dollar General, an upgrade there to overweight over at Barclays, with the analyst shifting to a more balanced view on food and hardline retailers. Now, the analyst says sales and margins could improve 
if Dollar General continues to clean up inventory as it has and invest more in its stores, which it has yet to do. The share is higher on the day by about 2.5%. And finally, big pharma company Merck lifted to outperform over at TD Cowan. The analyst urging investors to focus on patent expirations and other new assets, which he says could create a pipeline for making Merck an above average performer in 2024. I guess that's better than below average. Shares doing well today, up 2%, and those are some of our top calls. Let's stay in the sell side space. Let's stay in the healthcare space, in fact, and take a look at Walgreens. It posted its first quarter report earlier today, and while sales and earnings per share did beat estimates, the results overshadowed in a big way by an almost 50% reduction in that dividend. Shares having their worst day in months, and of course, not necessarily the best start for their new CEO. Charles Reed joining us right now. He's TD Cowan's Senior Research Analyst, Managing Director, covering healthcare technology. He still has an outperform rating on Walgreens shares. All right, this is going to be a bit of a referendum, I think, on Wentworth and his sort of uh, a new tenure, which is still relatively new. And I wonder if the commentary, Charles, that we got today out of him when it comes to the dividend and some of the other cost-cutting measures that he appears to be taking, whether this is sort of that proverbial, get all the bad stuff out of the way, so at some point in the near future, you can start focusing on growth. Yeah, Ramin, uh, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, I, I'd agree with you there. You know, I, I think uh, the dividend cut was largely expected. It, and obviously, I think you're, you're seeing sort of the natural reaction, uh, probably with some funds having to, to sell on that. But, you know, the, the main core of the issue here is is cash flow. And, you know, the sustainability of the dividend, I think, was has been called into question for some time. And I think what cutting the dividend does here, it really kind of lessens the pressure on on Tim here as he moves forward with his strategic vision for the company and I think gives him you know, more flexibility uh, down the road to, to make the right investments going forward. Right. It gives him some room. But at the same time, by slashing its dividend in half, does that change the complexion, the composition of its investor base? Well, you know, maybe in the short term it does. But I mean, I think if you look at the yield, uh, you know, you're still uh, even with half of it being cut at these levels. You know, I think the yield is still you know, very attractive relative to peers uh, in the healthcare services space. So I'm not sure that will uh, really detract people going forward. I, I think ultimately what we're looking for is, you know, how do we reinvigorate growth in the company? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we move forward from here? And, and that's sort of the task in front of them. Yeah, we're looking at a yield of 4.2% still for Walgreens, even after that uh, reduced dividend. So cost cutting is really the focus here. How, how deep can uh, Wentworth cut costs before it starts to really hit at muscle? Well, you know, I, I think it depends on where you're looking to cut here. And I, and I think what he kind of outlined is that, you know, the, the pharmacy remains central to their strategy, but clearly, you know, what that footprint looks like going forward uh, remains to be seen. And, and I think when you pair that with their other assets, you know, you think of Shields Pharmacy, you think of um, CareCentrics, uh, their investments in Village MD Summit, uh, you put all those together and, you know, I think looking forward, we can think about, uh, you know, what does it mean to be a national chain in, in a world where you have e-commerce and, you know, virtual options today? I think that does present some opportunities to uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, shrink that footprint a little bit uh, mm -hmm. to be more, uh, what would you call it, um, uh, in areas yeah. of density of your assets and uh, going forward, and that could be more effective. Well, but that gets to this idea here. Do we Are we going to see a, a, an even more of a fuller embrace of the healthcare side of this business? I mean, we can go in right now and do basic things, you know, get flu shots and things like that here. But I know there's been a lot of talk, at least prior to Wentworth arriving when, when Ross Brewer was still there, about how much deeper you can push into this space without the regulatory blowback from doing just that. Oh, absolutely. You know, I think that is the core strategy here at Walgreens. It's similar to when you look at someone like CVS as well, right? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, most of us probably go to our pharmacy more often than we'll ever go to our doctors in a single year. Uh, it, it is a location where you can get care. I think we should think of the pharmacy as a care setting. Uh, and there's no reason why more care can't be delivered uh, in an integrated way through the, the pharmacy location, um, you know, even beyond just getting, let's say, your annual vaccines and, and flu shots. So, you know, I think this is something where you think about home care, home delivery care, all mm -hmm. those kind of uh, kind of services, you know, there's no reason why uh, pushing it through a retail pharmacy network shouldn't be effective. 
All right. Well, it'd be interesting to see uh, just how much uh, Tim Wentworth can turn things around there. Uh, Charles, great to catch up with you. Charles Ree, uh, analyst over at TD Cowan, a closer look at Walgreens uh, Boots Alliance. Remember, this was a stock that had an awful uh, 2023, down 30 percent, replaced their CEO and yeah. unfortunately starting off 2024 on the wrong foot. But we've seen this play out before. Anytime you get a new CEO, there's always this tendency. Let's get the bad stuff out the of the way. Sink. And then at some point, in theory, uh, a few quarters from now, maybe we'll start to hear more about the growth plan. Walgreens has had a rough couple of years. I go yeah. back and think about Theranos and how they had bet big on Theranos mm -hmm. and, you know, wanted to kind of transform their whole business model based on this idea that people can come into yeah. their stores and go to the labs. And of course, that didn't work out at all. And they had to pay uh, huge uh, payments uh, to settle class action lawsuits. Yeah, absolutely. Here, it'll be interesting to see how uh, that could be a big story as well for 2024 as we continue to move along here in today's show. Coming up in just a bit, we're going to focus in on sports and particularly the business of sports. George Pine over at Bruin Capital, he's a founder and CEO, stopping by the big program. We're going to discuss the NCAA's proposal to pay college athletes and more. That's coming up next here on The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. It's time now for our Wall Street Week daily segment. The host of Wall Street Week, David Weston, joins us, as he does every day around this time. And, David, a lot of talk right now about college football, yeah. with the big championship game on Monday. Oh, you noticed that, did you? I did notice that. that? I, 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 I forget. <laughs> I, I know it's one of our Big Ten rivals. <laughs> yeah, right. um, but, yeah, it, Michigan Wolverines yeah. and Washington Huskies. But a lot of talk, not just about the game on the field, but the money behind it and whether how much of that's going to be shared with the players. And boy, is there yeah. a lot of money going yeah. around. To take us through it, somebody yeah. who really knows college football like nobody else, George Pine, he's Bruin Capital founder and CEO. George, great to have you back with us. So first of all, the news today, ESPN's got an extension now on the championship games. I think a lot of it may have to do with football. Just under a billion dollars, a billion dollars they're paying now. Is there anything left of the uh, amateur part of this athletics as opposed to the professional? Well, there's a lot of value in college sports. It's exciting. Uh, and of course, that's for 40 sports, men's and women, you know, the, for a billion dollars or a hundred million or so a year, you know, co the college football playoffs are going to go for a billion five to 2.3 billion just for the playoffs in college football. So that shows the disparity between college football and all the other sports out there. So, so where does this all go next? As you know, some coaches, including Mr. Harbaugh, my coach at Michigan, has said we should start paying the players. Is that inevitable? Well, a couple things. One, Great games this weekend. Both games went down to the last play, so the player movement really didn't hurt the quality of the competition. Where it's headed, I think you're going to have to pay the players. I mean, the, uh, college football is the number two sport in America. In attendance, in television ratings, generates six to eight billion dollars a year. And I think what you, those players deserve to be paid. And I think you see the courts now recognizing that, that um, it, the players, you can't restrict their trade, their motion, they need to be paid and share in some of that money. What does that look like, though? Where does that money come from? Does that flow from the schools directly, or is that going to come from the NCAA directly? It's going to come from the schools, uh -huh. right? And what you're going to see, I think, eventually is the players will be bargaining collectively. I think that they're probably going to have to do individual contracts so that they can restrict the movement. I mean, yeah. competitors, universities, well, our competitors, yeah. uh, cannot restrict the movement of players without compensation. And it, with that kind of money generating around, you're going to have to bargain collectively and guys will have to do individual contracts. That's going to be interesting. And, of course, that's going to be messy for a lot of schools. And I, I am curious, I mean, not to brag, David, but <laughs> Northwestern University, the Wildcats, the <laughs> team, they had actually attempted several years ago to unionize. And, of course, we, that ran into uh, uh, failures in the court system. What's different now that would allow something like that to happen that they couldn't do uh, 15 years ago? I think the money yeah. has just become so yeah. significant. So, like, if you take a step yeah. back, it's – the success of college sports. It's yeah. amazing. People love it, but it's huge business. And I think to, as a fairness principle, mm -hmm. the guy, you know, you think about the college football playoff, they're going to be getting over $100 million per, for one game. Yeah. Should the guys participating in that game share in that economic success? Mm -hmm. I think 9 out of 10 reasonable people say yes. So I think, you know, the money's so overwhelming but how, that it's... But how much, how much do you think could actually go to the players? I mean, we're talking a situation where a college player, in theory, a top-tier college player, could be making more than maybe sort of a middle-of-the-road professional athlete? I don't know if it goes yeah. that far, yeah. but I think there'll be some sharing. Yeah. And, of course, you have other things, too. Work conditions, mm -hmm. you know, how much they do in training, what the off-season looks like, how people move around. And yeah. it's complicated because people 
people are there to get an education, so you're trying to balance education, economic fairness, and keeping a, a reasonable model. And those are the yeah. things the industry is uh, grappling with, and it's quite complex. And part of the hard part is it's complex in a fragmented industry. Well, exactly. It's complex, and it's a huge change, a real sea change. Who's going to really be in charge of managing that sea change? Is the NCAA up to that job? Not everybody has complete confidence in the NCAA. I think the NCAA has a very difficult job. There are 1,100 members. We're talking probably 130 football members here, and even you could argue a smaller number. And so the NCAA is in a no-win situation. And the challenge is it's very fragmented. Industry, colleges, as you know, the colleges switch conferences, coaches switch teams, athletic directors move around, presidents move around, players are restricted, payers are not compensated. That's not going to fly. So I think you're gonna, it, it's either going to have one or two things. The courts are going to lead like they did with the NAL. People knew the NAL was coming for five years. The industry could not agree. The courts led the way. Same thing here. The courts will either lead the way, or I hope, because I love the, the sports, uh, I'd love to see the industry coalesce and come together with the solution. So it'll be one or two, the courts or the industry. The reason it's up in the air is it's so fragmented. So you say you love the sport. We do. I know Romain loves the sport. How do you preserve the sport, though, the competitiveness of the sport? Because in professional, for example, you have to really manage parity, because otherwise you get the haves and the have-nots, and the games aren't very good. Right. It's going to be very complicated. You have uh, all those issues, education, parity, fairness, very complex issues. And that's why it's hard to find a consensus amongst competitors of what to do. And so that's why it's going to be tricky, and that's why an inability to agree could lead to the courts deciding and not the industry. Uh, we've had a little space now since uh, the name image likeness uh, became uh, law of the land, for lack of a better phrase here. Is there anything we can learn from the rollout and implementation of that uh, in, in, in terms of extrapolating what a rollout of actually paying the payers directly would be? Well, they were on, uh, NIL was hoped to be uh, based on endorsement revenue. Mm -hmm. It became a legal way to pay players right. and so it had unintended uh, consequences mm -hmm. in the competition of the sport. And people don't like that. And that's why I think it'd be better if you had uh, things collectively bargained and people did contracts because you'd have predictability, you'd have rules, it'd be better organized. The NIL kind of led to a free-for-all and the intended consequence, and intention was to pay the players for endorsements and yeah. it came really pay to play. So uh, we've talked about some of the disparities among uh, schools. What about among sports? Because we're talking about football here. What does this do to the, the so-called lesser sports in a lot of these schools? Do they get left behind? It's primarily football. Basketball has meaningful value, too. But the rest of the sports are really not in the same area. And one of the concerns there, one, are Title IX, how it affect uh, women's athletics. And two is the Olympic movement. The Olympic movement internationally, many of the best athletes in the world come to America to train, as well as the American athletes. And that system has provided for, that, for those sports. So those sports uh, are being underwritten by the revenues primarily from football. And so if that money goes to the players, that money may not be there for those other sports. George, you've been on the inside of so long. If you were to guess, how long is this process going to take? When will this settle back down? I think it'll take three to five years to, to shake out. I think if the industry does it, it'll be within the next three years. If it's settled through the courts, it'll take a little longer, maybe five years. It gets, gets to this idea, though, also of just amateur sports in general, and in addition to the actual collegiate itself, that whole universe of Olympic athletes who, of course, have had their own battles and being able to uh, get compensated for uh, their images and for their performance as well here. Have we kind of moved to the stage in society now where there really won't any be true amateur sports, at least not at the elite level? No, I think there will be. Yeah. I mean, elite golf or these other sports, I think, will, will remain think, amateur. Okay. But, like, but like the Olympics, think yeah. about the Olympics. There was a time where you couldn't have pros in the Olympics. Yeah. They transitioned they modernize and people love the Olympic Games I think that's my hope is the same can happen for college athletics but you're gonna might have to separate football and basketball from the other sports because those issues are quite different than the other sports it's all inevitable is it good for the sport hmm. in your judgment well, I think it will be you know we've heard so much negativity about the transfer portal and player movement look those games this weekend were fantastic yeah. so I think the game will stay true this is a choppy period it's an evolution hopefully not a revolution yeah. Uh, David's afraid to ask you this question, but who's going to win on Monday, uh, the Huskies I, uh, or the Wolverines? Look, I wouldn't sleep on the Washington Huskies because that quarterback, Michael Penix, is a great quarterback. But I think you have to go with the Maize and Blue. They've done an amazing job. Jim Harbaugh, they've done an incredible, built a program over 10 years, three straight trips to the CFP. 
I don't think you can go against the maize and blue. Romain, I can't add anything to that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the final word, no question about it. Really great to have you. That's George Pine of Bruin Capital. He's the founder and CEO there. So this is really going to be exciting, I must say. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. I'm good. I mean, obviously, I don't have a rooting interest for either team, but yeah. I guess I'll root for the Big Ten since I'm from the Big Ten. There you go. Yeah, yeah I'm sure. root for Northwestern, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, I do. I appreciate yeah, it's it. a great school. Yeah. It's a great school. <laughs> okay. On Friday, we're going to have a talk with... Uh, David Otter, he's an MIT professor of economics. We talked to him in detail about what's going on with generative AI and how it's going to affect the labor market in particular. That's at 6 p.m. Eastern time on Friday, Romain. All right, a lot of great conversations uh, coming up with David Weston, who joins us every day around this time for our Wall Street Week daily segment. And of course, you can check him out once a week on his own show, which airs at 6 p.m. Uh, every Friday evening here in New York. Stick with us here. We're rounding out into the final hour of trading here on this Thursday afternoon. A bit of a, I guess, less interesting market than what we had the prior two days, but the net effect of it all is about the same here. Stocks remain on the back foot, still awaiting the next big catalyst, a big one on deck starting tomorrow morning with that U.S. jobs report. Stick with us. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Just about 3 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. Let's get a view from the top. I'm Romain Vostick. And I'm Scarlett Foon. After two days of losses, pretty big losses, in fact, in the equity markets, things are starting to come back to normal a bit. Yeah, I mean, kind of the oscillations here. I don't know how much conviction are in any of these trades, either to the upside or to the downside. Maybe this is folks waiting for, I guess, more definitive catalysts. We do get one of those tomorrow morning, yep. potentially, uh, with that jobs report. Uh, but, of course, I think people really did want more clarity on the rates picture, and you're probably not going to get that until you hear from, well, the one person who can sort of give you that guidance, and that's Jay Powell, and they don't meet until the end of the month. Well, we do have that jobs report before then. We also have inflation numbers before then, and we also have bank earnings before then as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the bank earnings could be big as well. I mean, we always kind of uh, poo-poo them to a certain extent because you never really learn anything, but then you always learn something yeah. because particularly not necessarily in the numbers themselves, but in the commentary we get uh, out of uh, Jamie Dimon, Gorman, and the rest of the cohorts here in the U.S. I'll flip up the board here because there was one call that I wanted to focus on here because we've been talking a lot about the dollar and whether that's going to be a big factor in the markets this year. Uh, Morgan Stanley was actually one of the few uh, big firms out there that was still uh, betting uh, for the dollar to weaken uh, late this year here. It has now reversed that call, and it's basically citing the decline that we've been seeing in Treasury yields here. I put this chart up here because this is the CFTC data, which is where everyone's basically been betting. Asset positioning, managers, I say, yeah. has been positioning around uh, dollar weakness here. So it'll be interesting to see sort of who ends up right or wrong, but this kind of puts them more in line uh, with the rest of Wall Street. Yeah, well, there's a lot of question marks over uh, what happens with the dollar, especially when it comes to the yen, for instance, too, yeah. because the Bank of Japan, how does it move forward with extricating itself out of negative interest rates? Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's take a look at some uh, individual movers. There was some M&A uh, this morning, and so APA, uh, which is a buyer here, formerly known as Apache, down as much as 7.5% on plans to buy Callan Petroleum for about 38 31 a share in an all-stock transaction, adding more oil exposure to its asset base in the Permian Basin. Yeah, and this is uh, this is going to be the big story. I mean, how many? I've, I've lost track. We've had at least two big deals, yeah. and then about Chevron three and smaller deals already. Add this, that's a fourth, and that's in the span of, what, about three or four weeks? There's more to come, yeah. as they keep telling us. Yeah. All right, we're also looking at WW, formerly known as Weight Watchers, down as much as 16% after Lilly, Eli Lilly. Are we Lilly. not losing weight anymore? <laughs> not so much that. Eli Lilly is uh, launching a digital healthcare platform to deliver weight loss drugs, which poses huh. a threat to what uh, WW had done because they've wow. bought a telehealth obesity drug provider <laughs> last year. That is a check and mate. Yes, what else exactly. <laughs> QuantumScape, a battery developer rallying as much as 47% on above average volume. Volkswagen yesterday said a solid state battery prototype from uh, QuantumScape significantly exceeded industry targets in recent tests. Yeah, okay, that's good. I mean, I guess we need, you know, more of this technology yeah, to sort of get up need to more suppliers the out there. The question, though, is what's the end market looking like now? We were speaking with Ed Ludlow earlier about that was obviously a focus on autonomous driving, but it all kind of lumps in as to whether these new technologies are ready for mass adoption. As everyone has says, long-term positive, short-term bumpy. Absolutely here. Meanwhile, we are one hour away from the closing bell here on this Thursday afternoon. Our cross-platform coverage better than anywhere else. It starts right now. 
countdown to the close. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage ahead of the U.S. market close starts right now. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're joined right now by our colleagues, Carol Masser and Tim Stenovic in the radio booth as we welcome our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms, TV, radio, Bloomberg Originals, and our partnership here uh, with YouTube uh, on I guess Jobs Eve, Carol Masser. Yeah. I guess maybe everyone's just waiting. Market's not really doing much today, which I probably no. welcome relief given just how poorly it did the previous two days. Well, but I think a lot can change at 8.30 a.m. tomorrow morning. I think with the data points, certainly on the labor market so far, showing that there's nothing urgent that the Fed has to do uh, right now. Having said that... I mean, we're still all employed. <laughs> For, For now. now. <laughs> Bad still We works. all said that at the same time. <laughs> um, one of the things that we've been looking for, right, because we look for other statistics and data points to help us tell what's going on in the economy. And we've talked about the holiday shopping season, especially when it comes to online. We saw it bump up from the year before. It was a record number, uh, this from Adobe. But what's interesting is that a lot of people were doing it with the buy now, pay later mm. programs. In fact, that hitting an all-time uh, record number uh, for those that track it. So it makes me say, okay, great, we're spending, but hey, at some point, like you got to pay for all this stuff, and you do wonder whether that's going to cause some problems down the road. Yeah, I have a lot of questions about this data. And that number, by the way, uh, an all-time high of $16.6 billion dollars. Uh, for e-commerce purchases just in the last two months of the year, Scarlett. Are people using buy now, pay later more now because of the availability of the service? More and more uh, companies are, are mm -hmm. using it. Like, you know, a firm signed that big partnership with Walmart recently, so, the, so it's available in more places. Are they using it because they know about it more? Are they using it in place of credit cards? And at the end of the day, is it necessarily a good thing if people don't have the cash to pay for this stuff now and they're paying for it over that a long period of time? That is the eternal question. I don't think so. Right. I mean, for the younger generation, certainly it is replacing credit cards. What? But it'll be interesting to hear from the banks when they start reporting okay. what they say about uh, credit quality and such card use. Here. Well, why, why should, well, no, but, uh, no, in all seriousness, why should I yeah. be concerned about this? Because I, I, and, and, I don't, and I'm not trying to be a flip here, right? But if we're talking about people using basically a form of credit to make their purchases here, is that... The fact that it's under these buy now, pay later services, is that materially different than if they had just put it on a, a traditional credit it, card? It is because these these buy now, pay later services, to my understanding, don't have the same credit checks of the people who are using the services. So you don't yeah. have to go through the same credit worthiness Absolutely. process. Although they would argue that, you know, that's that a biased process it and it's not that's, necessarily, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a whole other conversation. There's a lot of exactly. teenagers yeah. using buy now, pay later. Let's yeah. just go with I that. Think what's also are there really? Well, yeah. we've had. Oh, really? Well, mm. uh, teenagers shouldn't. I mean, what's going on in the Foo household here? I, I don't know if teenagers <laughs> should have credit cards. I, <laughs> Sounds like they're there's targeting a younger at home. buyers, younger shoppers. <laughs> okay. How about that? But okay. I will say, there was some, uh, we've had some guests on who said, well, people feel confident to do buy now, pay later. They're like, I'm going to have that money. We know I've got to put aside. I'm just going to do it, take advantage of this, and then pay later. So I don't know. I the U.S. consumer is eternally confident and optimistic. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, let's talk about how Microsoft is moving forward with um, integrating AI into its hardware. Hardware. It's adding an AI key and making a change to its PC keyboard. This is the first mm. change since 1994. Right to the right side of the space bar on a Windows uh, keyboard, okay. you're going to have the co-pilot button. <laughs> Not right now, Romain. Oh. It's going to come out okay. soon. Yeah. It's where the blue one is, Romain, on your technology keyboard. Works. I thought it just showed up. No, no, no. they, they got to change the hardware and everything. It's going to be a big to-do at the CES show. Does it Vegas. actually do something, the button, when you turn it on? Yeah, yeah. You'll, you know, you'll press you know it. It'll does, launch Carol all those AI do? functions. What does it do? I don't know. You know, it's interesting. We talked with... <laughs> Man, we're a rough crowd today. We're ready for Friday. Um, we talked with Bloomberg senior editor Sam Potter about a recent Bloomberg Big Take. It was basically everything you need to know about Wall Street. They took a look at more than 600, 650 Wall Street calls and what they found in terms of something that could move stocks this year. So much research talked about artificial intelligence again. I don't know whether that's a... Do, is it a contrarian goal, what everybody's talking about? Are they late to the party? Are they late to the party? Or it's just a reminder that we're early in on this cycle and there's a lot yet to maybe be gained and figure out. What's the adoption going to be, though? I mean, I, I mean, I know we're talking no. about the keyboard, which is definitely much more consumer facing, where while a lot of the big activity is going on with the businesses behind the scenes. But I mean, has that hype cycle died down? I think it's just slowly being incorporated. They've talked a lot about it. And then over time, they'll start and, to do it. The second half of this year is supposed yeah. to be the time when now, am I required to now it? go out and replace all my keyboards? No, you don't have to. It'll, it'll be done for it. you, Romaine. Oh. Yeah. Oh, by really? AI. <laughs> 
Hey, it's it's a reminder of Microsoft's gonna, commitment to AI. Though, just, I mean, when I'm sleeping. I just hope it's not going to be like Clippy, where you press the button by accident. And, the original you know, that, AI. Right, right. That yes. um, little clip during Microsoft Excel pops up and you can't do anything else. No, just I don't buy now, pay later. Don't do it on buy now, pay later, <laughs> if you're going to do it. Um, oh. All right, guys. We'll buy now, back. pay now is what I say. Buy now. <laughs> Very nice. Sound like my dad. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it got quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> all right, guys, we'll be back in less than an hour's time. Our cross-platform coverage, we're going to wrap up whew, the Thursday trading day. Radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals. Join us for Beyond the Bell at 4 p.m. Wall Street time. All right, and we continue our coverage right here on Bloomberg Television. Counting you down to the closing bells. Just about 50 minutes or so until we get there. Pleased to say joining us right now is Jeffrey Sherman. He's Double Line Capital's Deputy Chief Investment Officer. Uh, Jeff, great to see you again here. Uh, as you know, there's been so much talk right now about what 2024 is going to hold. Is it going to be materially different than 2023? Uh, so far, it seems like we're just kind of singing from the same hymnal that we had for a good portion of last year here. I mean, what are you sort of banking on as far as anything being materially different than what we saw last year? Well, if you think about where we're starting the year, like at least from the bond market's perspective, it's not much different than where we entered last year. Uh, there was a lot of volatility throughout the year. I think that the 10-year Treasury effectively almost closed exactly where it started, uh, 2020, or where it closed in 2022. So as you start to look across the board, I think the, the things that have changed a little bit are some of the risk in the market. I know last year it was something like, um, I don't know, like 80% of economists were forecasting for a recession last year and that Fed policy was going to be a bit, uh, very problematic. And, uh, you know, it didn't really materialize. But I think th those risks are still building out there. But the big question is, is, that, is the Fed going to actually do the opposite and come to the rescue? And, you know, you're starting to see there's, there's talks of, if you look at the Fed minutes yesterday, there were talks of rate hikes in it, there's talks of a pause in it, and there's talks of rate cuts in it. So mm -hmm. I think there's something for everyone right now. <laughs> and uh, really, I think what we're going to have to be focusing on is the labor market. And I was listening to your banter about the, the buy now, pay later concept, too. And that doesn't give me a, a lot of great feelings about the consumer if we're just using credit to get there. And again, maybe it's a substitute for a credit card. Maybe it's something else. Yeah. But I, I think that as you look as, as you look into this year, to the, the risks are still there mm -hmm. uh, for that recession. And ultimately, I think it's going to really come down to uh, essentially how the labor market unfolds. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what everybody's focused in on, probably less so than maybe the direct inflation reports. I am curious that when you go back to early last year, when everybody really was predicting the potential for a recession, and we should just, in fairness, that our folks here at Bloomberg Intelligence were predicting 100% chance of a recession in 2023. That proved to be wrong, but there was a reason why those calls were made, Jeff. You saw the data. It was all there, suggesting, yep. at least on a historical yeah. basis, we were headed towards one. You had a yield curve inversion that was the, the worst that we've seen since the financial crisis. What happened? Well, um, 100% is tough in markets, so I would, I would caution your, your, uh, your, your economists from always doing 100% probability. <laughs> At least put a 99.9 on I don't have set on to them. That's why, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I would never say zero either. That's called infinitesimal <laughs> on the other side. So uh, that's just my little mathematical brain. But uh, at the end of the day, I, I think what, what's happened there is that those, those risks still are, are present. And so the thing is, the yield curve is still inverted. This is one of the longest uh, tenures of, of uh, yield curve inversion when you look at like twos, tens, um, since really back in the early 40s. And so it's really problematic uh, that you see that the market is really fighting the Fed here, too. And so the market, the, the rallies we've seen, uh, what we've been calling the, the, the everything rally since November 1st, um, really just started to really be predicated on rate cuts again. So if the Fed was really tried and true with their higher for longer mantra, uh, I think that we would get closer to the recession. And, you know, when people call for soft landings, usually what that means is that there's some problematic area of the economy. It just doesn't have the breadth across. That, that's what makes it a hard landing. And so uh, I still think that there, there are still some challenged areas. But if, if we start to see some of these rate cuts, maybe some of those problematic areas do get skirted. And and, and the, the Fed achieves the, the miracle of being able to really navigate this hiking cycle and be able to normalize policy back without causing pain. The problem is, is that historically, the Fed has a 100% track record in most of these instances um, of causing a recession, at least when they stay dedicated to the hiking cycle. Right, right. Well, interest rates are a very blunt tool when it comes down to it. You mentioned risks. What is the bigger risk right now? Um, a reignition in inflation or a stronger than expected labor market, which is kind of what we're seeing signs of right now. 
Yeah, I, I think the labor market has been relatively strong. I know a lot of people question it, saying, you know, is it the birth-death model? And, you know, we've seen some net revisions negative. But but on, on whole, the labor market has, has held up pretty resiliently. And when you look at unemployment claims today, the new data coming out, whether it's continuing or initial claims, they're, they're, not, they're not putting up red flags at this point. And so um, I, I don't think that the labor market is going to reignite and you're going to start to see three and 400,000 jobs per month being created. Uh, but I do think that the bigger risk is the inflation. And I think the Fed will have concerns about some of this, which is why we kind of scratch our heads with Jay Powell at the last press conference. You know, in November, he talked about financial conditions being tight, the bond market signaling it, then bought rates rally, financial conditions ease. Mm -hmm. It made no mention really of it at the last press conference. But if the Fed does believe in these wealth effects um, that, that we heard from Bernanke in, in two administrations ago at the Fed, that ultimately, you know, when when people feel wealthier, risk assets rally, their portfolios go up, they spend more, maybe then all of a sudden this starts to cause some concern at the Fed that we start to see this kind of reacceleration of inflation. But uh, at this stage, we, we see core inflation has been dampening. The trajectory is right, but the market is definitely extrapolating this into that the Fed is going to normalize yeah. policy back to a much lower rate. And uh, it just seems that it's a little optimistic today mm -hmm. to think that's going to happen so soon as early as March. So when it comes down to it, a lot of corporate bond analysts will look at the credit market right now, look at where spreads are right now and say that at least at the end of December, it was priced for perfection. Given where we stand right now after two days of declines, and I know we're seeing a bit of recovery today, what's priced right now? Yeah. What's priced in? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's perfection out there, but I think what it is is that we're, we're going to have a smooth process or the softest kind of landing. Or um, I, I don't typically believe in a no landing scenario because there's always a bankruptcy or two there. But uh, I think what you see in corporate spreads is that the idea that at least the can is kicked down the road. And think about the problems we saw with high yield and spreads widening out. Once we got the rally, you saw a lot of refinancing activity over the summer. Uh, some of the, the debt that was due, let's say in 2024, got extended out. And you're seeing that both in investor grade and high yield where the, the tenors or the maturities have been have been uh, taken out farther along the curve. And so typically when you have a big default cycle, it's either concentrated in one industry or you have what's called the maturity wall that, that really hits where you get all this debt that has to be refinanced at the same time and the market kind of has indigestion over that. And so the smoothness of some of this refinancing has probably caused some of these spreads to come in a little bit as well when you look at the overall market, because in general, what you've seen is just this kind of idea that, well, the debt isn't due. It's buy now, pay later, right? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what we're talking about. All you have to do is carry the coupon. And so you're willing to finance at a higher coupon simply because you want to be able to survive through the cycle. And so um, this is this is part of, I think, where, where you see spreads being tighter is for that reason. So I don't know if it's perfection. I mean, remember, pre-pandemic, we've seen spreads inside of 100 on corporate bonds. I mean, um, there was a period there in the in the mid-teens where we trade in the 60s and 70s. So yeah. you, you have this idea where ultimately this isn't perfection, yeah. but it doesn't give you a lot of wiggle room at this stage. Is it easier now, uh, I guess, to uh, execute, execute uh, the trades and, and whatever sort of investment vision that's coming out of the investment community there? Is it easier to do that now in this environment versus maybe where we were at the start of the rate hiking cycle? Well, I, I think right now what you see is that the, the issuance activity is picked up because yields are lower. So not just spreads being tighter, but effectively the treasury rates being lower. So when you, when you look at the rally we've seen over the last you know couple of months, I mean, in some instances, some parts of the curve are in 100 basis points. And mm -hmm. so this all of a sudden makes it meaningfully more attractive for these, these companies to come out. So I know our corporate team has been talking about it uh, in our meetings this week about just the amount of issuance coming in the marketplace again, because corporate CFOs are smart. Yeah. They say, hey, it's a good time to access the market. We don't know how long it lasts. Let's go ahead and let's get out into the market and do some of our traditional issuance. And so there, there's the ideal uh, ability to affect those trades. But at the beginning of the hiking cycle, it was still pretty easy as well because there was this, this uh, dearth of supply coming because effectively people are saying, oh, here comes the hiking cycle. <laughs> right. I need to go issue the debt today. Right. So it, it's it, the idea here is, is not that, you know, it's, it's ever easier, or more challenging. It's all about liquidity. 
And when you get rate rally, or I'm sorry, you get asset price rallies, things become easier to yes. execute. And what we're seeing right now is what, what our, our credit folks call a grabby market. And that's it, a technical term we use here. Just people are looking for bonds. They're grabbing onto anything, <laughs> anything that has yield right now. And so you're seeing this, especially in markets that haven't had supply, something like our commercial real estate markets, right? right, right. CMBS, which was very problematic for a lot of investors. We're, we're hearing about people trying to bid on bonds three, four points higher today. And what it is is that they're thinking about the end of the hiking cycle. They're thinking that these things are potentially going to start to clear better. Mm -hmm. And so you're starting to see some of that activity. But, um, you know, that, that's where we teach patience and persistence. So you have a seasoned team. You don't go chase those of grabby course. type of areas. And you make sure you have the positioning coming into it. A grabby market. I like the way you put that. Jeffrey Sherman of Double Line Capital. Appreciate your joining us and giving us some of your time. Coming up on the close, TikTok has big plans for its e-commerce business in the U.S. and in doing so, posing a major threat to Amazon. And Alberto Muslim named as the next St. Louis Fed president. We're going to take a look at his background and his outlook on interest rate policy. And as we count you down towards the close, we're going to get insight on today's trading from Katrina Dudley, Franklin Mutual Series Portfolio Manager and Investment Strategist. This is The Close. This is the countdown to the close. Just about 39 minutes until we get to those closing bells here. A mixed day in the market. A bit of a relief, I guess, coming off the last two days where we saw significant uh, drops in all of the asset classes worldwide. A bit more of a measured day here with some green on your screen, including some gains in the bank stocks. Remember, they're going to start to report earnings at the end of next week here. We're seeing a bid come into that, similar like we saw yesterday. What we're not seeing a bid come into are some of those magnificent seven stocks. Tesla is getting bid up, but still seeing significant declines today in Alphabet, Amazon, as well as weakness in Apple. The Philadelphia Semiconductor Index only down three to four tenths of a percent here on the day, but chalk that up here as that daily losing streak continues to get further out on the spectrum. Healthcare stocks getting a bit of a bid and Bitcoin remains in focus here. The Bloomberg Galaxy Bitcoin Index now uh, at that 4,900 level here and a lot of the stocks surrounding that also moving higher. That includes Marathon Digital up about 11 percent coming off that two to three percent gain that it had yesterday. Also some interesting commentary on AbbVie, as well as American Express, when we're talking so much about consumer spending and whether it will hold up. Those are the bright spots right now. That's where folks are making money. But that is just one day of trading. And of course, this can all switch on a dime, depending on what happens tomorrow morning with the release, Scarlett, of that U.S. employment report. Yep. It's still early in this year for us to come up with any big themes. Now, coming up, when it comes to Miami real estate, billionaires, they're pricing out the mere millionaires. This is The Close on Bloomberg. What do Jeff Bezos, Carl Icahn, and Tom Brady all have in common? They own homes in Indian Creek. This is an island off the coast of Miami, and the area remain has seen such a migration of wealth, it's often referred to as Florida's billionaire bunker. Uh, Bezos said in November he's moving to South Florida. He's already bought two properties, and his people have reached out to three other homeowners to buy their properties. People out in Indian Creek? Well, yeah. We should point out, there aren't there many homes in Indian Creek here. I mean, I grew up down Limited in this supply. area. supply. And it's kind of interesting, though, we talk about uh, the sort of the millionaires being priced out. When I was a kid, this was kind of the island of millionaires, and I guess being a millionaire isn't good enough anymore. No. Uh, but it's interesting. I mean, it's, he's obviously in good company. You mentioned Tom Brady and uh, basically anyone who, I guess, wants to spend the money, uh, they can live there. But won't we think of those poor millionaires who are now sitting on these huge tax bills because their property values just keep going up because Bezos comes in and buys, you know, tens of millions of dollars. That's a good point. Where are they going to go to next? <laughs> I don't know. They got to they they scrap it out for uh, housing like I the rest know. of us. Well, they could come to New York. Aren't prices moderating here? <laughs> <laughs> no, they went up last month. <laughs> did they? Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. I, I've learned a lot of it. And did you know this, this, uh, this village, which is literally like 30 houses, yeah. people forget that, it has its own mayor? That is interesting. And did you know who the mayor is? The show. He's a guy who founded all those duty-free stores in, the, in airports. Very appropriate. I just learned that today. News you can use right here on Bloomberg.
This is the countdown to the close. Just about 30 minutes left to go here in the trading day and a much different day than what we saw the last two days, but not a whole lot of gains either. Not a whole lot of gains. In fact, we did start off with some gains. They were fairly modest, but we couldn't hold on to them. So right now it looks like the S&P 500 on track for a third decline of the year, the new year so far. But again, we're only down by one tenth of one percent. When you look at the S&P 500 and its 11 sectors, pretty evenly split here. Healthcare and industrials leading the way, but the gains are only about half of one percent each. Uh, the real weakness here is in energy stocks. All 23 big cap energy companies are lower. Oil prices are down as well. Energy off by 1.6 percent. Consumer discretionary and technology uh, continue to be a weak link there. And of course, consumer discretionary and infotech does reflect some losses in the Magnificent Seven as well. Yeah, still seeing a lot of weakness in the technology space. I think Mobileye is really emblematic of that. You can see the number on the screen, a drop of about 26 percent. That's the worst day for this company since it went public back in 2022. And a lot of this has to do with some concerns here about what the end market really looks like for electric electric vehicles as well as autonomous driving vehicles, uh, a, a market that, of course, Immobilize was right at the center of. Also seeing a downdraft in ConAgra. The shares down 2% after the company cut its guidance. Remember, they make things like Slim Jim and Duncan Hines and a Hunt's tomato sauce. They're actually saying that organic revenue growth for the fiscal year, the fiscal year that ends in May, that's going to be down about 1% to 2%, not up. Remember, the previous guidance was for an increase. Organic sales scheduled to be down. That's why you're seeing the shares sell off. But I do want to end on two bright spots here. Allstate. Insurance companies, for whatever reason, have been on fire as of late. Allstate right now at 147.94. That's going to be a record high should it close at that level. Up 2% on the back of an upgrade over at Morgan Stanley, which actually said that this entire industry is improving as the auto side of the business starts to improve after really uh, sort of hurting a lot of these companies last year. And then on top of that, they're saying... Uh, that the company actually could benefit too as well uh, by with fewer underwriting losses. And then look at Peloton. We don't talk much about this company anymore. A 15% gain today. That's the best gain that it's had on a daily basis going back to November. And why? Well, it has a partnership, apparently, with TikTok. This is actually going to be the first time that Peloton has actually produced any kind of custom content outside of its own platform. So TikTok, Scarlett, now the partner with Peloton. Ah, perfect segue. Let's talk about TikTok because the company is plotting a more than $17 billion shopping business. This is a pretty ambitious target that sets up a clash with the likes of Amazon, Timu, and Shein. Bloomberg's Alex Barinka joining us now from San Francisco with more. So this shopping business uh, that TikTok is looking to build on is already taking place in Southeast Asia, and um, it's now looking to expand that to Latin America and the U.S. What will that look like? Absolutely. So TikTok Shop US launched this year before the holiday season, and that's a brand new business. That is the business that TikTok, according to our sources, is starting to sell almost $18 billion worth of merchandise on in its first calendar year in operation. Just to give a little context there, Scarlett, we broke the news last year that for 2023, globally, around the world, TikTok was targeting $20 billion in merchandise value. So this would be a really quick takeoff for a U.S. shopping business that TikTok has rolled out here in the U.S. Now, their strategy here it looks different than, uh, than in Southeast Asia, and that's by design. Um, I, I wrote about it earlier in 2023. They initially looked at Western markets like the U.K. and the U.S. and thought that they could just port over live stream shopping, which is incredibly popular in Indonesia, Malaysia, and China, where people get online videos and they sell stuff. Well, that didn't work with users in these markets who are not used to tuning in and buying things live. So they have split up their strategy. They're focusing on live stream video without shopping, and they're also focusing on shop. And Scarlett, that's where that Peloton partnership potentially also comes in on the live stream video piece. I'm curious about just the, uh, the usage of this. I mean, you, you, you highlight the differences between what some Asian consumers are willing to do versus what maybe we're willing to do in the U.S. here. Uh, do you not think that the U.S. market could evolve to where the Asian market is, where the people are actually consuming the content in real time, live in that sense, and then obviously uh, buying things? Because, I mean, there are certain uh, you know, age demographics, at least in this country, that I think have already gravitated to that. Absolutely. And according to my sources, that's kind of the thinking internally as well. They have to get people used to not just scrolling a feed of videos that people posted in the past and perhaps shopping from them, but TikTok's also trying to get people just used to live stream video in general. They've been rolling out a bunch of incentives for creators, uh, incentivizing them to spend more time on live. You're seeing partnerships like this one with Peloton to bring more interesting live video. So people in the U.S. can just get more used to spending their time there, which was their strategy in general. The average user by 
my my some accounts is spending 90 minutes or more on the app in the US, which is more than any other social media app. So it seems like they kind of know the trick to getting those eyeballs to being yeah. really sticky for their users. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we do see them go by the way of live stream shopping down the line yeah. when they've been able to change user behavior. All right, Alex Barinka there out there in Los Angeles, the headline on TikTok looking to expand uh, its uh, US e-commerce business tenfold to as much as $17.5 billion this year alone. Another big headline on the Bloomberg terminal earlier today involves Qualcomm unveiling a new chip for virtual and mixed reality headsets. It's expected to be used by Samsung and Google as they ramp up products to compete with Apple's forthcoming Vision Pro. Ian King joining us right now who helped break this story uh, for us. And Ian, uh, let's talk a little bit about this. This is a Snapdragon XR2 Plus chip. Explain that to me in, in simple terms as a layperson, what exactly this chip does and why it's better than what they already have. Well, what every uh, headset needs, whether it's the, the, the cool glasses, the Ray-Ban glasses that we've seen, or whether it's the big headsets for virtual reality, is a, a processor and a graphics processor to drive the images and supply the information that gets beamed in front of the user's eyes. This is an upgraded version. It's going to be 4K for each eye, and it's going to have up to 12, maybe even more than 12 cameras, <laughs> which allow the headset to sort of position the person in the world around it and find orientations, check where their eyes are looking, everything like that. 12 cameras. Do we all need 12 cameras? Now, Qualcomm has been a longtime supplier to Apple. Did they have anything to say about Apple's Vision Pro, which they're clearly not a part of? Yeah, I mean, uh, there was a little bit of commentary on a, on a briefing we got, and it was a bit of a debate about whether it's better to have just a one-chip solution that deals with everything that doesn't need a, some kind of cord coming out of your back and going to another pack, which is obviously the design that Apple has gone for. So there was a bit of criticism there, but nothing direct. You know, Qualcomm are, are basically just hoping that their customers, uh, that the, the ones that have signed up to do them, are going to be doing the talking for them against Apple with the type of products that are really going to catch on with people. Yeah, is, is though, though this, all, this whole uh, push into augmented reality, uh, whatever we're calling it these days, I don't know what buzzword Apple prefers here, but when they first sort of announced that Vision Pro, and we talked with Mark Gurman a lot about this, I mean, their initial reaction was kind of tepid. I think some people focus in on the price, other people sort of focus in on the idea of what do I actually use this for? Do you think we're going to see material progress in marketing this and making this more of a mass market product this year? No, I think you're going to the heart of the matter there, Romain. It's like these things have been around for a while. The problem is, is well, what do we use them for? Well, they're okay for gaming. They're okay for some professional applications. But, you know, they haven't really grabbed the attention of consumers or, or professional users and with something that they absolutely have. The Apple version that we saw that was heavily integrated with Apple's computing, maybe that's the way forward. Maybe these things become a replacement for the screen and help you with everything that you would do on, on the computer. But you're absolutely right. Ask anybody in the industry, what are these things good at? And you get yeah. a kind of mixture of responses. Yeah, we all remember Google Glass from about 10 years ago and how that never really caught on. Ian, um, with all your experience in covering semiconductor companies, is this going to be a meaningful contributor to Qualcomm's revenue, or is this just kind of a Qualcomm getting its feet into the, you know, into the market of VR, AR, and you know, however they want to brand this technology? Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question, and it's very important for them. They've promised investors that they will be more than just a mobile phone chip company, mm. and they're trying desperately for, you know, in a number of areas. None of them have really taken off so far. Perhaps this is the one we're up to version 2.5 right now. Usually for chip makers, version 3 is the one that is going to win if, it, if it's indeed going to happen. All right. If it is indeed going to happen. Of course, when it does, you'll be there to cover it for us. Ian King, uh, Bloomberg's uh, senior semiconductor reporter joining us from the West Coast. Thank you so much. Coming up, we've got the top three where we focus in on the top three movers and shakers at the center of the day's biggest stories. This is The Close on Bloomberg.
it's time now for the top three. Every day at this time, we do a deep dive into the people at the center of the day's top stories. And for the first person, I'm watching Romain Mark Zuckerberg. The Meta CEO sold almost half a billion dollars of the company's shares in the final two months of the year. And this was a very deliberate effort to cash in while the stock was on a tear because Facebook Facebook Meta went from 301 at the end of October to 353 at the end of December. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I you know, good for him. I, it's his money. I guess he should take it. Uh, <laughs> I wonder if this is just kind of part of a, a traditional a sales plan or if he uh, had something special here. But, you know, I mean, look, I mean, the stock had a phenomenal run, an yeah. uh, unexpected run, I think, by, by some measures here. Uh, and now he's uh, taking a few chips off the table. Yeah. In fact, a, a Meta spokesperson says that um, Mark Zuckerberg usually sells Meta shares yeah. to fund philanthropic initiatives. All right. Well, speaking of chips, another person I'm keeping an eye on is Chip Wilson. He's the founder of Lululemon. Remember, he started this company back in the late 90s and then was ousted from the company, more or less, uh, back in 2013 here. Uh, he gave a, an interesting interview with Forbes. It was like, and this was a wide ranging interview. Remember, he's been looking for other ventures, basically saying that, well, Lululemon really isn't meant for anyone. And that uh, the fact that the company is sort of embracing diversity and, and he's really meaning diverse bodies, mm -hmm. meaning different body types. As if you've seen Lululemon ads, you know, it used to always be these very lithe looking women. And now they're using people of all different body right. types. He's not on board with that. Now, what, the, what this struck me as odd was I went back and looked at the tape. He gave an interview back in 2013 with Bloomberg. Yes, News, he did. Where he basically said the exact same thing, and then he proceeded to lose his job like a month after that interview. Now, I'm not saying that was directly correlated. There were other issues why he got sort of fo forced out by the board. But he's been banging this drum for, well, a decade now. And even he's though he's not with the company, he's, yeah, he's not affiliated with the company. He basically sold his stake, and he's not affiliated. But he clearly has some very clear views as to how he thinks people should look, at least when they're wearing uh, Lululemon tops. Yeah, and he has very strong opinions yeah. about Lululemon. He says the brand isn't reaching its potential due to fear of media backlash, yeah. uh, you know, bring in that idea yeah. of That was an know, interesting comment, too, because the first thing I did was look at how the stock has done since he left. And it's done pretty well. Surprise. Yeah. Okay, I think that says it all, right? Um, the third person that we're watching is Alberto Muslim. He was appointed the new head of the St. Louis Fed after a career that includes executive roles at Tudor, a hedge fund owned by Tudor, as well as a senior advisor role to the New York Fed president. Uh, he's not going to be a voting member in 2024, but he will be in 2025. The big question I have here. Yes. Does he own a bicycle? <laughs> Does he own a bicycle? Yeah. Um, Explain. Anyway, uh, well, of course, his predecessor, you know, of course, uh, made some headlines when we did a great profile uh, of him where he kind of used his example of trying to buy a bicycle uh, during the uh, pandemic and how long it took and how that was a reflection of not only disruption in supply chains, but concerns about inflationary pressures. It was a it was a very interesting moment to kind of bring it home to the brand thing. Yeah. Anyway, I don't I have to say I don't know much about him. I have had to admit that prior today I never even heard from him. Uh, but you look at his resume. It's pretty long. It's pretty vast. And he certainly qualified for the job and we wish him the best. Stick with us. Katrina Dudley, Franklin Mutual Series Portfolio Manager, joining us after the break. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic here alongside Scarlett Fu with about 10 minutes until we get to the closing bell. Scarlett, stocks pretty much across the board are flat on the day, but maybe that's a welcome reprieve given what happened the previous two days. Right. We're no longer losing quite a bit of ground. We're just losing some ground. And in fact, uh, the indexes just took a leg lower in the last few minutes. Uh, so it doesn't look like we're going to be able to claw our way to the first gain of the new year for the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. Treasuries under pressure. You could see the 10-year yield uh, moving higher, but just shy of that 4% level. And then, of course, there's the yen that we need to talk about because there's some speculation it'll be hard for the Bank of Japan to exit negative interest rates following the earthquake. This has been the longest running drama of when will the BOJ finally move out of negative interest rates and it has yet to happen. Yeah, interesting uh, stories there uh, occurring across the tape here. A little bit of a holding pattern ahead of a big earnings, uh, excuse me, a big a jobs report, I should say, tomorrow morning coming out of Washington. Meanwhile, in the here and now with about nine minutes until the closing bell, Katrina Dudley joining us, Franklin Mutual Series Portfolio Manager and investment strategist. Katrina, great to see you here in the new year. And is the new year going to bring much different than what we saw last year? Look, if I go back um, to last year when we were speaking, we were talking about the fact that you know we didn't think it was going to be a big, deep recession, that we probably could muddle along. And if it was, we would we were going to see kind of this job-filled recession. And that was a different consensus view. As I look at 2020, 
before, I'm looking at consensus earning es estimates that are up around 11 plus percent. Um, and I think that they're too high. I think that there are a lot of pressures on margins. And one of the ones that hasn't really been spoken about is wage pressure. And those numbers continue to come in higher than we expect. And we think that companies in the kind of you know, sluggish demand environment are going to have a tough time trying to pass along higher pricing yeah. in order to cover these higher wages. Well, square that circle for me, because just this morning I was speaking with our uh, chief uh, uh, equity strategist here at Bloomberg Intelligence. And we were talking about this idea of some of the earnings estimates actually starting to creep up uh, after sort of being either flat to down for a good portion of last year. I, and I know at the start of every year, things are a little bit more optimistic uh, in, compared to where we get into the middle of the year. But do you think that estimates where they stand right now are maybe a little bit too far above where they should be? I think that they still are too far above. And I really just think that people aren't modeling in some of these headwinds that I just spoke about. Um, you're also looking at, you know, the impact of rising interest rates are really going to start to bite this year. Um, I don't think there was much of a headwind to earnings last year as companies were kind of tailing off, you know, low interest rate type of debt. But they're now starting to have to layer in this higher interest rate debt. And that's going to impact net income. And I think we, you know, we've been taught to kind of focus on the EBIT numbers, so earnings before interest and taxes, but we do think that interest is a real cost and it needs to be taken into account. Absolutely. So as companies look for growth drivers while feeling the pressure of costs like wages, um, we're starting to see more activism, activist investors coming in. Uh, you're seeing a lot of M&A take place as well. How does that change how you look at uh, the different sectors out there? Are there certain areas of the market that are more uh, likely to engage in M&A consolidation that therefore look more interesting to you? I think some of the areas of the market where you're going to see M&A is where there are real cultural fit and that there are real economies of scale and you've got sectors where maybe there are some secular headwinds that are going to be pressuring the company. So I think in that situation, you know, two companies coming to get together, one plus one in that situation is going to equal three. I think you're going to see that in the healthcare sector. I think you've already seen a lot of um, activity in that sector. Mm -hmm. And I think you're going to continue to see it in sectors such as industrials. Um, and I think that what it is, is this idea that, you know, you're bigger and better and stronger together. Yeah, and of course, we've seen it in energy as well with uh, APA's uh, purchase today as well. Um, I also want to bring up, I know it's at the end of 2024, but we have ele an election coming up. And in fact, there's going to be a number of elections in 2024 as well. Obviously, your people are going to invest according to the fundamentals, but how does that disrupt perhaps your investment strategy? What, what do you need to keep in mind when it comes to the volatility that those uh, that, that polling might create? Look, I think 41% of the world's population are going to the polls during this year. So it's not just a U.S. phenomenon, which obviously we're focused on here with the presidential election. We've got a lot of elections going on around the world. Um, those elections impact not just the policy in the country, there's also follow-on impact. So you think about what happened when America released our green energy plan. There were follow-on plans in other companies to match some of the infrastructure spending that we were doing. And that's where you need to take the intersection of politics and, um, you know, the stock exchange is where is money going and where can it be beneficial to companies? And the, and the other side of the coin is particularly, you know, in the United States where we're running a deficit, all money is not going to be free. So something's going to have to get cut. So you want to look at those sectors which are going to be cut and where those earnings headwinds are going to exist. This gets us back to the question, though, as to whether global economic conditions will be supportive of any sort of upside narrative here. And I know here in the U.S., we continue to see stability and that resiliency, as you pointed out, in wages and in the labor market here. Are the correlations, though, with the rest of the world, particularly some of the developed economies and, for that matter, China as well, are those correlations strong enough that we should be worried? I have a look at China and I think a lot of companies, I think there was an article out this morning talking about reinforcing those Chinese, you know, the information barriers that exist between companies that are Western based and their Chinese subsidiaries. And I think that China will be an engine, but it hasn't been the engine of growth in 2023 that we all anticipated it was going to be. We kind of thought that it would have a post-2022 COVID spring back and we didn't see any of that. 
Um, we like the Japanese market. While the valuations are very close to the S&P on a headline basis, mm -hmm. we think that there are just so many underlying structural reforms there that are combined with the weakening, um, you know, the weakening of the yen, which is going to support their earnings. So we, um, we we're we're very very you know optimistic about you know some of these other international markets. All right, Katrina, as we get ready to uh, say goodbye to you, just a quick question here on big tech because we somehow have managed not to talk about the magnificent seven. Um, there are losses are deepening today and they have yet to gain in 2024. In fact, Magnificent 7 is off for a fifth straight day. Is big tech in trouble? Um, from a valuation perspective, the multiples are about seven points above the rest of the market. So there is some risk there on the multiple compression. If I take a look at some of the factors that have driven, it's been very thematic. Um, you had chat GPT was a big driver. Um, you had a lot of the chip stocks being driven by that. And I'm just not sure what the next you know, big thematic driver for 2024 is going to be for these tech stocks. So I'm not necessarily sure that they've got a lot more downside, but I think on a relative basis, the Magnificent Seven are more likely to underperform than outperform. Katrina, always great to catch up with you. Katrina Dudley there over at Franklin Mutual, helping us count down to the closing bells. Just about uh, two and a half minutes away here. Most of the major indices right now uh, hitting session lows here in the red, not quite as deep as some of the losses that we saw yesterday here. But the S&P now down about three tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq down a half percent. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, the lone holdout here, holding the line in the green. Our full market coverage coming up in just a second as we take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're counting you down to the closing bell. And here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with our friends Carol Masser and Tim Stenovic. Welcome to our audiences across our Bloomberg platforms. And I feel like this is a rinse and repeat, though, of the last couple of days, guys, where as we yeah. get closer to the bell, we start to see the sell-off intensify here. Socks right now. At session lows. Yeah, negative tone here, right? In these final few minutes, we're all thinking about tomorrow's monthly jobs report. Having said that, that five year, not five year, forgive me, the NASDAQ 100 five day on track for a five day losing streak. And that would be what the longest that we've seen since December of 2022. So we think about, you know, kind of technical moves or trend lines um, that could be fairly significant. We just talked to someone who's very bullish, and he has a pretty good track record, at least based on what he made, the call that he made last year. We're talking about Ryan Dietrich uh, over at the Carson Group. Uh, he says he still sees a strong consumer. He's still bullish right now. He sees, says the odds of recession are slim. Um, and when you have a good end of the year rally like we just had, uh, it's like a slingshot for the next year. And he says, on average, stocks go up double digits after a rally like we saw in the last two months of the year. Yeah, but what happens next will depend entirely on earnings and whether the earnings can justify the gains that we've seen so far, particularly in some of the companies that have really led the way, um, the Magnificent Seven among them. Um, it'll be interesting to see whether that happens. Katrina Dudley of Franklin Mutual is just telling us she sees them as more likely to underperform than mm. outperform. Gina talking, Gina Martin Adams talking about earnings hitting a major low in 2023 and maybe set for a recovery. So I guess we'll get to get a feel of it, you guys, as earnings start to come out. Well, one uh, thing I thought was interesting now. is, as you know, we do those surveys where they get the year-end strategist estimates and they also ask them for their year-end estimates uh, for uh, earnings on the S&P in aggregate. And it was kind of interesting to see that the pace of upgrades on the price target did not uh, go up as fast when it comes to um, the actual earnings numbers themselves mm -hmm. here. So a bit of a disconnect, maybe potentially. With the mixed bag here on Wall Street with the Dow Jones Industrial Average, once again, holding in the green, but only by a fraction of a fraction of a percent, up about 10 points on the day. The S&P 500 decidedly in the red, down 16 points or three tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq Composite lower by about six tenths of a percent. And the Russell 2000, which had been fighting to stay in the green, is going to close it out in the red, only down by about one and a half points. Yeah, I'm thinking about a headline. What was it about an hour ago where money markets... Uh, fund assets rising to fresh records from the ICI. So I'm thinking about investors maybe just taking some money off the table, uh, Scarlett, after the runs that we saw last year. Yeah, although it's notable that that rotation out of tech and into things like small caps continues with small caps 
outperforming the broader market and certainly outperforming tech. All right, this is what the S&P 500 looks like when you split it up into two dozen industry groups. Healthcare equipment, banks, and household and personal products leading the gains, although these gains are fairly modest, uh, no more than two-thirds of 1%. On the downside, uh, falling oil prices dragging all 23 big cap oil companies lower. Retailers also down by 1.6%. And tech hardware lower by more than 1%. All right, let's get to some of the individual gainers. I'm sure you guys were talking about it. Peloton up 14% in today's session, launching a partnership with TikTok to create a fitness hub on TikTok. TikTok and basically tap into a whole new, you know, bunch of customers potentially and users. So this is what they're looking to basically broaden their audience. Uh, the agreement marks the first time Peloton will produce custom social content for a partner outside of its own network. It's had its own kind of network and keeping it within the house. So now it's reaching out. Stock, keep in mind, still down about 95% from its all-time high back in January of 2021. So it's got a lot of ground to catch up. Cannabis stocks, I don't know if you guys noticed on a little bit of a move higher, You're if you will. You're a little bit of a what? <laughs> <laughs> Cure Leaf Holdings, I'm ignoring. Up 3.8% in today's session, up almost 7% of its highs today. Um, the Drug Enforcement Administration here in the United States confirmed it is reviewing marijuana's federal drug classification. So could this give some juice, if you will, to some of the uh, cannabis uh, companies that are out there? Uh, we shall see, but it de- definitely in today's trade and what was overall a lower trade. Dollar General, uh, number two gainer in the S&P 500. Barclays upgrading it to overweight from equal weight. They shifted from a defensive view to a more balanced view on broad lines, hard lines, and food retail in 2024. Home Depot, by the way, also getting an upgrade from those folks. So we saw Dollar General up 2.6%. And I did want to mention Netflix. It was up about two and a quarter percent at its highs today, still finishing with almost a one percent gain. JP Morgan bullish on the company, talking about its ability to accelerate revenue growth, expand margins, and drive multi year free cash. Uh, uh, cash flow growth. And they also talked about the company maybe expanding some of their price increases to some other markets. They've already started doing that, we know, in the last year or so. So, yeah, some gainers here. Okay, well, let's go to decliners. This one, the same first decliner that I've said for the last two days. Take, checking in on shares of Apple, down more than 1.2%, down for a fourth day in a row today. Uh, this after analysts at Piper Sandler cut their rating, citing a weak macro environment in China that will dampen demand for iPhones. Uh, Apple down 6% in the last four days. It's shed $180 billion in market cap just over the last four days. Got to talk Mobileye, too. Uh, They were down as much as 29%, having their worst day ever earlier in the day. Still closing down 25%, having its worst day ever. Uh, This is the autonomous driving technology company uh, that provides the tech for companies like Porsche and Volkswagen. Uh, Shares falling to their lowest level since November of 2022. That that was just a month after the company was spun off from Intel. Um, The company did give a full year revenue forecast that fell far below Wall Street's expectations. And the company did say that uh, customers are paring back orders because they have excess inventory. This is an interesting one. Weight Watchers, WW International, as it's known now, uh, down 11.1% today, uh, plunging the most in more than three months after Eli Lilly launched a digital healthcare platform that's going to allow the drug maker to directly deliver these GLP-1 weight loss drugs to customers. That's a threat of that threatens a key area of growth for WW. WW had this has this direct consumer platform that they acquired uh, in March of last year, Romaine, and that helped propel shares uh, to more than double last year. But getting hit today on this Eli Lilly news. All right, some of the big movers in the equity space. Let's check in on what happened in the bond market today, particularly when it comes to treasuries and the sell-off in treasuries did continue. A fourth straight day of price declines for the two-year uh, treasury, which pushed yields higher on the day by about five basis points, 438 right now on your two-year. The 10-year did trade above 4% once again today. The looks like settlement's going to come in just a smidge below that here. But once again, the entirety of the yield curve shifting higher here. And that's largely because of a lot of uh, mixed opinions right now about what the Fed may do next. But the consensus, at least for today, is that all of those rate hikes, the six rate hikes that have been priced into this market as recently as three days ago, maybe, just maybe, that might be a bit too extreme. Yeah, but that that was the case a couple of weeks ago as well. What the Fed does next, of course, will be determined by all the data that's out there. The Fed is data dependent. And of course, we get the big jobs report tomorrow. I don't know what you guys have been hearing from the guests you've been speaking with, but when we talk to people, they're all saying they're looking at wages um, because wages is a, a source of concern, and particularly when it comes to earnings, that a lot of these companies can't pass their costs on anymore to the consumer. Yeah. And you think about how that's going to play into the pressure on those inflation numbers and what happens. We did talk with Steve Matthews. I mean, what they want to see in terms of the core PCE number that the Fed 
looks at um, that key metric that it has gotten below 2%, but they want to see it for a longer period of time. He talked about, what, another six months maybe of it. So mm-hmm. it does make me wonder how much the Fed is just going to hold off um, and make sure that in terms of inflation being put to bed that it, they've really done it. It does uh, remind me of our conversation earlier with Gina Martin-Adams, who reminded us that the consumer roaming is just not as strong as the consumer was over the last 18 months and is starting to get tapped out. But at the same time, she doesn't think that's going to affect stock valuation significantly uh, because she said the consumer is not the stock market and the stock market is not the consumer. So even if consumers don't feel as comfortable as they've been feeling uh, over the last few years when it comes to how much excess cash they have, their yeah. spending power and more, yeah. um, that's not going to affect stocks the way that a lot of people think it would. Yeah, well, it may not affect stocks in aggregate here, but there's certainly pockets of this market, particularly once you get outside the S&P 500, that are a little bit better reflection of the economy. And you see the drag in those stocks over the last, you know, I don't know, four or five months that maybe gives you a sense here uh, that we've seen that tamp down. Well, look at ConAgra uh, today, for example. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Yeah. I thought you told me it wasn't the economy. Uh, well, uh, it's not the whole economy. <laughs> okay. Walgreens. Uh, I mean, maybe, I, maybe I know, well, I'm not, and I'm not trying to be too. flip here, but, no, but yeah. the stock market isn't the economy, but it does reflect back on the, on, on the economy, and the economy reflects back on the stock market. And we've seen the weakness there. The question is how widespread is that, that consumer weakness, I should say, how widespread is that consumer weakness going to be, yeah. and do we need to worry about it? The other p- p- uh, posit that's been out there is this idea that we could end up in kind of one of those bifurcated recessions where uh, people at the lower end of the spectrum feel the recession people higher at the higher end of the income spectrum, they don't feel a thing. Well, we heard during the last earnings season from companies that were saying that things were not looking so good in the new year and that consumer spending was starting to look a little bit iffy, but that didn't stop the rally from happening anyway. No, but I would, and I go back to what Romain said, I would argue that, you know, already people at the lower end of the economic spectrum are feeling it, no doubt about it. We have these conversations, yep, inflation, um, not at levels we saw a year ago, but prices are still higher. Yeah. And so and I, say, and I don't want to editorialize too much, but I mean, we, we've been down this road before in past business cycles where everyone said, look, everything's fine. Yeah, there's weakness there, but look, the stock market's not the economy and we know what happens next year. Sentiment can shift on a dime here. And it's not always just about what that headline number and whatever data, and whatever data report says. It's really about the feeling on the ground. And if people aren't spending, that has a way of catching up with us really fast. Right. Or like we talked about earlier, the buy now, pay later. If more people are you, you, you know, we've talked about you know tapping credit or getting tapped out, if you will. Um, that's already problematic. And you did do we wonder- resolve the question of whether that was problematic or not? I thought there was some disagreement no, on that. There's, there's still some disagreement. disagreement. There's some red flags oh, okay. going up. <laughs> we'll, we'll get back to you tomorrow. I'm yes, done. do that, please. I'm done. Yeah, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, obviously, tomorrow we'll be talking about the jobs report. That's a wrap for our cross-platform coverage: radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals. We call it Beyond the Bell. We will catch up with you tomorrow. All right. A lot more coverage coming up here on Bloomberg Television. Don't go anywhere here. A lot of concerns right now about supply chain issues and whether that could become an economic problem with the disruptions in the Red Sea because of geopolitical issues and, of course, the climate change issues going on down at the Panama Canal. Brandon Daniels is going to be joining us. He's the CEO of a supply chain uh, company called Exiger. He's going to be joining us after the break right here on The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. Romaine Bostic here. I'm joined right now by Gina Martin-Adams. She is uh, Bloomberg Intelligence's senior, uh, or chief, I should say, uh, equity strategist. I always forget your title, but you are basically the person doing a lot of the great research here into sort of what moves the stock markets and why. And today's price action was, you know, kind of a little bit more muted than what we saw yesterday. But this does seem to be like people are positioning for something. I'm just not quite sure what. Yeah, or it could just be the start of the year after an incredibly robust end of 2023 Mm -hmm. and investors are taking some profits after some extreme gains. Mm -hmm. Um, We did detect a sentiment peak as likely by the end of December, just considering how overbought um, the market was in general. RSI is reaching peaks not seen since 2021. Mm -hmm. Our market pulse index suggesting a level of mania that we hadn't seen since July. So certainly we were due for a breather. And then the Fed threw a little bit of cold water on some hopes that Fed policy will 
will reverse quickly and reverse robustly this year. I am curious, and you can see the numbers there for our viewers here, about three-tenths of a percent drop on the S&P 500. Similar moves lower for a lot of the other major indices. Wasn't a lot of help today from the Magnificent Seven, and I don't know if we can put that chart up uh, on the Magnificent Seven and some of the buy ratings we see on those stocks. And I know sell-side buy ratings aren't always uh, completely indicative of true sentiment on the street yeah. here. But what do you make of still what I guess is, is a still bullishness out there for it? Or? Uh, I think it's yeah. cooling a little bit. We have I mean, you've had a couple of Apple downgrades on yeah. Apple, generally yeah. some sour news on Apple yeah. toward the end of the year, a lot of concern about supply chains and generally manufacturing, also valuations for many of these stocks are just through the roof. So mm -hmm. we've got to get into earnings season and frankly, we end up needing to get earnings proving the case for owning these stocks. And so I would expect to see something like the fourth quarter earnings season as a potential catalyst to reinvigorate some confidence. But for now, mm -hmm. it's looking like investors generally taking a bit of profits. I'm glad too. you brought up supply chains. Do you think this is going to become a bigger issue for the markets this year? Not, I mean, I know maybe not to the extent we were speaking with the, one of your colleagues on Bloomberg Intelligence, Lee Clasco. He said, we're not going to see what we saw back in the pandemic yeah. where prices just went crazy for shipping. But they're elevated now by a significant amount. Yeah, they are elevated. Yeah. And this is a different market than we became accustomed to over a period of intense globalization, really starting in the 1980s, going all the way through the 2000s, in which supply chains were more and more open, inflation pressures were easing persistently. Mm -hmm. We do appear to have turned some kind of corner with the last cycle, really starting in the middle of the last decade and then getting exacerbated through the pandemic, where supply chains are, have a lot more friction. And certainly geopolitical pressures are adding to those frictions, yeah. but also generally political pressures at large yeah. are adding to the frictions there. All right. Well, I brought that up to here because I do want to stay on that topic. It has been something that a lot of people are talking about with the tensions in the Red Sea overseas affecting global supply chains. And of course, the issue in the Panama Canal and quite a other few choke points going on out there right now. Uh, Brandon Daniels is joining us. He's the CEO of a company called Exeger. It advises Fortune 500 companies on these supply chain issues. And I would assume, Brandon, you have to be getting a lot of calls over the last few weeks and months. Well, Romain and Gina, thank you for having me on. Um, it, we're not just getting calls over the last few months. Sustainably, uh, from the pandemic uh, till now, um, we've been seeing a growth CAGR, CAGR here at Exeger, where we deploy our artificial intel intelligence solutions to help companies uh, manage this kind of disruption. We've been growing at a steady CAGR over 80% year on year. And that's because companies across sectors, also the U.S. federal government, global governments, are trying to grapple with the impacts that supply chain disruption have not just on prices, but on our ability to operate, our ability to execute, um, whether it's in major weapons systems or it's in IT systems, the ability to deliver and to continue to scale and to see the economic growth that we need in order for them to hit targets is so dependent on this fragile supply chain. And so we're seeing a lot of calls now, um, but it has been a sustainable uh, sort of growth and, and cry that we've seen from the corporate community trying to grapple with these new issues. Brandon, can you distinguish between the types of issues that your clients are calling you about? Because from my seat, it seems that we have some short-term potential disruptions, and then we have longer-term issues that companies are trying to contend with with respect to their supply chain, such as climate change, and just an, an exacerbation in risk due to weather events accelerating worldwide. How much of what you're talking about is really just short-term in nature with respect to things like what's happening in the Red Sea versus a longer-term discussion about strategically modifying supply chains right now? Well, uh, the, the thing that we have to realize is that the geopolitical nature of what we're seeing in the Red Sea, right? This tension in the Middle East um, between these Iran-backed militants and what's happening right now in Israel, um, this is a sustained set of constraints that are found across our geopolitical landscape, right? If you look at what's been happening between the United States and China, for instance, uh, over the last four or five years, um, as we've seen greater dislocation, greater decoupling, especially in advanced uh, electronics, advanced technology, this geopolitical aspect of competition is a consistent issue 
uh, that's coming up in supply chains. Now, it has many forms, like what we're seeing in the Red Sea today, yeah. which is disrupting 30 percent of the traffic that's going to the United States East Coast. Um, but this is one form of sustained issue. Um, it's just take it, it's coming up and popping up in many uh, pockets and exposing more and more fragility. But we're also seeing things like cyber resilience becoming a problem, where it's also the supply chain of how you manufacture software yeah. and the ability to get the engineering resources or the ability to secure yeah. uh, those software packages that are going into devices that people are concerned with. Yeah. And then finally, as you mentioned, you know, environmental, social, and governance issues, so modern slavery risks, um, issues uh, that are impacting um, the way in which people are procuring uh, goods, like, yeah. for instance, um, changes to climate. Those are things that are sustained, and people are looking, our customers, which are the largest corporations in the world, yeah. um, they're looking five to seven years out and trying to create real reform, real transformation in the supply chain. And so this is... But just scratching the surface of a much deeper problem yeah. that's going to have to work its way out of the system and, and really needs today's technology to do so. Well, let's talk a little bit more about those solutions. I mean, we were speaking earlier on this show about we saw container shipping rates up, you know, something like 200 percent over the last few weeks. Uh, but how does that sort of feed through into, I guess, what I would ultimately see on a grocery store shelf or at, you know, the furniture store? Is there a direct correlation between those rates and what we end up paying on, at, at the retail level? So, so that's a great question. Um, there are obviously multiple factors that lead to what's the price on the grocery store shelf. The, the, the escalations, the supply push that we saw in the pandemic, that was certainly due to increases in shipping rates, congestion at ports, higher uh, cost of labor, higher cost of, uh, you know, local localized logistics as they saw congestion at ports. That was a supply push point. Also, the, the shutdown of manufacturing facilities and so and so, so on and so forth all created price issues. But those were also coupled with high demand. And as you were talking about just before um, uh, our uh, conversation, there is a slight decrease in um, consumer demand, uh, which is creating a, uh, at least a gap in demand versus the supply push. There also is an easing of inflation that we've seen. And so that is impacting and affecting prices. And so I don't think we're going to see consumer prices move in the short term. Mm -hmm. But I do think that these systemic and sustained supply chain issues are going to lead to either reform or consistent instability in pricing for the near future. Brandon, you alluded to one solution being the implementation of technology to improve efficiency in the supply chain landscape in general. What other sorts of solutions are you pursuing with your client base? Yeah, I mean, there are a number of things. So uh, first of all, investment in manufacturing processes uh, is, a, is a huge area of development, right? Robotics, um, uh, advanced ways in which to warehouse and to uh, manage inventory. I mean, those are things that people are, are doing as they're looking to either move away from just-in-time delivery or build localized or uh, local manufacturing. Like, one of the things that you've seen uh, after the pandemic is a lot of movement of manufacturing from Asia um, to Mexico. Now, that is still problematic uh, in that geopolitical issues are, you know, uh, causing people to say that they're going to, you know, shut borders and therefore cutting off potential trade routes like rail trade routes between the United States and Mexico, showing even further instability and fragility in our supply chains. But I think reshoring, reform, diversification of supply chains is the first thing. And then secondarily, it's automation and innovation in the way that we're manufacturing goods. There's also finally a new frontier of um, critical minerals sourcing, uh, where people are taking things like copper um, or uh, lithium, and they're sourcing them or recycling them in new ways. Yeah. That's a huge area of innovation that's going to take down some of the supply chain uh, issues that we've seen. Brandon, great conversation. We should catch up again soon. Brandon Daniels there, the CEO of Exadrill, which consults with companies here on some of those supply chain issues. A big story here that could be a big story for the rest of the year. A lot more to cover here on the big program today, though, including the company behind Wilson Tennis Rackets and Solomon Skis filing to go public. This is indicative here of better health in the IPO market. That conversation coming up after the break right here on Bloomberg.
All right, let's focus in on the IPO market. Amer Sports, you've never heard of that, but you have heard of Wilson Tennis Rackets and Solomon Ski Boots. That's the parent company, and it has filed for a U.S. initial public offering. Bailey Lipschultz joining us right now to talk a little bit more about this. First, let's start off specifically with this company here. Uh, we know what they make. Why now? Are they coming to market because of what? Well, it's partly, Romain, the fact that they do have some debt maturing. This is now an opportunity for them to tap capital markets, recycle some of the cash being raised through an IPO to uh, allay some of those debt issues. And it's really just been a saga. And this is one of the many companies we've been reporting on uh, over the last two years has been kind of kicking the tires in terms of going public. And right now, with the filing in the first few days of 2024, it does seem like they are gearing up to be one of the first out the gate after what's really been a very quiet two year stretch. It's interesting. Uh, I noticed that the IPO is going to be more than a, mil a billion dollars listing the firm in a, at a value of almost $10 billion potentially. Talk about the multiple landscape right now, because I would imagine valuing a company in this kind of environment is pretty tough. There have been such little or few IPOs for the last year, year and a half. Um, talk to us about the multiple, where it lands relative to recent deals, maybe, and how the companies are approaching the market at this point. Yeah, Gina, it's shaping up to really be the first big consumer facing company to go public since Birkenstock in October of last year, which had its own rocky start to being a public company. The expectations and really what analysts have been calling out, looking at the early filing from Amur, is the fact that they are growing in China so rapidly. China, uh, through the first nine months of this year, accounted for nearly one fifth of their revenue. And they're continuing to grow in terms of opening up stores, as well as going through direct to consumer. It is an interesting company, just given the size, as you mentioned, uh, that potential valuation, how that plays into peers, who they best will be compared to, because yeah. while they do have a portfolio of products you yeah. make tennis rackets and footballs but you also make skis so kind of a, yeah. a range of products yeah a range of products and fun products too we should point out bailey while you were speaking we actually put on the screen there some other potential ipos that co could come to market some of them actually look like they could be fun skims which is that i, I don't know shapewear i don't know what you call it here but that's kim kardashian reddit uh which who knows what they do and then Shein, which just <laughs> makes uh, cheap clothes that you can just throw away after you wear them yeah, those are the ones that we're keeping an eye on and bankers and investors are looking at. When you look at kind of what is going to be coming to market, the biggest thing that comes up in conversations with bankers and advisors is either profitability or the path to profitability. So the big question for Reddit for the last few years has been how they can really continue to grow and actually derive growing profits as opposed to just giving given their kind of loyal users skims as you mentioned the kim yeah. k uh brand and ability yeah. to grow revenues has been something that we've been keeping an eye on all right bailey lipschultz has been all over this maybe potentially he can have a pretty busy year assuming the ipo market picks up bailey lipschultz of bloomberg news stick with us a lot more coming up including a closer look at health care that's coming up after the break right here on bloomberg Here we are on the third trading day of the year and the big profitability that we saw, at least on a price basis in U.S. equity markets in 2023, maybe leading to a little bit of profit taking here at the start of the year. Five straight days of declines for the Nasdaq 100, four days straight days of declines for the S&P 500. The gains today were fractional to be sure, not quite the big sell off that we had seen yesterday here. But the sentiment certainly has shifted just a tad here as folks wait for another sign, another catalyst, if you will, uh, to take stocks any higher. We do get one of those catalysts tomorrow with the big jobs report coming uh, out of the U.S. government tomorrow morning. And of course, at the end of the month, we get that Fed meeting. And in between that, we get the start of earnings season. Eight of the 11 S&P sectors did finish the day in the red, but there were a few bright spots. You saw record highs on a lot of insurance companies and you saw continued strength in the healthcare space. Let's stick in healthcare right now because there were some big news for pharmacy benefit manager, manager CVS Caremark. Starting on April 1st, the company says it's no longer going to offer Humira, a drug manufactured by AbbVie that's used to treat arthritis and other diseases. Instead, it's going to offer a copycat version of the drug. Joining us for now to talk, uh, to, to talk a little bit more how this will play out is John Tazi, healthcare reporter for us here at Bloomberg News. And let's get right to the heart of the matter. When we talk about these copycat drugs, we're talking about biosimilars yep. here. Why, making, why are they making this move now? And I guess more importantly, why didn't they make this move, say, two years ago? Yeah, it's a good question. So the biosimilars for Humira, uh, which is one of the best-selling drugs in history, 
uh, only reached the market about a year ago. The first one was uh, beginning to be sold just about a year ago. More came online mid last year. Uh, we saw some adoption of those. A lot of companies were putting them uh, sort of on their formularies, on their list of approved drugs alongside Humira. What CVS is doing is they're saying for their most of their commercial health uh, drug benefit plans that Humira will no longer be available. Only the biosimilar versions will be available. So this is obviously not great for AbbVie. Um, it'll take a little bit of a bite out of AbbVie's profits, and that seems to be reflected in the stock now as of today. But how big is the bite going to be? And then who are the beneficiaries of this? Yeah, so I mean, AbbVie has seen this day coming for a long time, right? So it's something that the company and investors were anticipating, expecting. Um, the uh, sales of Humira uh, were over 20 billion in 2022. Those are basically going to be less than half uh, this year, according to analyst estimates. So they are taking a bite. Um, it will potentially benefit other uh, manufacturers. Sandoz is one of the biosimilar manufacturers working with CVS. May also benefit uh, CVS and uh, some of its clients through lower costs. All right, uh, John, uh, great uh, to catch up with you here. Uh, and of course, that was just one of many healthcare stories uh, that we broke today here on the Bloomberg Terminal. It's been a big focus of investors, quite frankly, for the last year or so. And most of the investors we talked to say that healthcare will probably dominate the conversation here in 2024, particularly when it comes to M&A. The total deal value in that sector, it actually reached $60 billion globally last year. That's according to a Bain & Company's latest global healthcare private equity report. For more on that report and what type uh, of activity we can expect to see this year, we're joined right now by Nira Jane. He's the co-lead of Healthcare Private Equity. And we should note that Bain & Company is a management consulting firm, which is separate from Bain Capital. Great to have you here. Thank you for having me. Let's talk about some of that deal activity, because it did stand out in a year when there really wasn't a lot of deal activity, relatively speaking. Why did we see some modicum of strength there? Uh, well, you know, healthcare has always been a place that has uh, performed well in private equity markets, especially in turbulent times. So if you look historically on deal returns, healthcare has better deal returns than uh, every other segment mm -hmm. of the economy uh, in private equity deals mm -hmm. uh, in, in times like this. So I think that's one reason. The second is that, look, the pandemic was um, so tragic and, and so detrimental to so many parts of our global society and economy. But what it did do is it, it shone a light on healthcare as an important segment, mm -hmm. both as infrastructure and as a place for innovation. Yeah. And so we've seen investors continue to put more and more uh, focus in this area. Well, let's dice up this industry a bit because healthcare is a pretty vast umbrella, right? I mean, we could be talking about going to the doctor. We could be talking about the technology that those doctors use or the pharma companies here. Are there certain pockets of that sector that are performing better than others? Yeah, I think you see interest in uh, a variety of areas, and I'd say what underlies all of these things is innovation. So life sciences, mm. uh, the you know the buzzword bingos around GLP ones. It was M M on RNA uh, last year, and so there's a lot of innovation that's happening in the life sciences segment. So that ends up being an interesting area. Healthcare IT for reasons beyond just generative AI. Generative AI gets a lot of the headlines right now, but if you look at healthcare, if you want to figure out how to, ways to expand care do it more efficiently, do it in ways that are more labor efficient, then you have to have more and more technology adoption. And healthcare, frankly, has been behind on healthcare adoption versus other segments of our economy. And so you see a lot of interest in healthcare IT as well. Can you talk a little bit about how the deals are being funded in an environment of higher interest rates? Where's the funding coming from? How is it getting funded? What kind of multiples are we paying for here in this space? Yeah, it's a great question. So you, if you look at healthcare deal activity this year from a value perspective, what all the private equity investors will tell you is, well, it's way down from the $150 billion of deals that we saw in 2021. And one of the reasons for that is credit availability and the cost of credit. So you continue to see credit flowing. You've seen private credit play a bigger role in the market, uh, particularly in the last 12 to 24 months. Um, and then you see some folks uh, funding with increased equity. You see some folks that are partnering with corporates, so getting more creative on how they go off and, and do deals. But you know, as I remind folks, if you look at the long history of private equity investing, there were great private deals that were done in high interest rate environments. I think you're continuing to see folks recalibrate. And in 2024, you're going to see more deal activity with these higher interest rates. Right. And how do you see the public-private partnerships kind of working the way through the system? Are you seeing some of the biggest public companies also incredibly interested in acquiring some of these startups? Yeah, you do. So you see uh, public companies interested in privately owned companies. You see a lot of uh, private equity investors 
doing carve-outs or uh, what we call the public to private transactions. So taking a company uh, private, we actually saw a huge increase uh, in 2023 in, in that activity, it's particularly as the sponsor to sponsor market or private private equity selling to private equity saw a, a, a large decrease. And so you see lots of different ways that, that those transactions can work. What you also see is corporate partnering with a private equity investor to say, this is some innovation that we want to go and fund. We want to do it with a partner that will know how to go and do this well. We obviously have our corporate uh, skills and strategic skills that we can bring to the table. And so you see these these marriages happening uh, around certain areas. I mean, and that's coming from the top down, though. When we get down to the limited, uh, to, to the LPs here, are they also as encouraged by this, given, I guess, um, some of the, uh, I guess, flatness that we saw in the, in the last year? That's a great question, yeah. Romain. I think the LPs are agitating at yeah. the moment when they look at the amount of uh, capital put to work yeah. this year versus two years ago, where we saw that high watermark or uh, capital being returned to them, so so DPI. Yeah. Uh, both of those are in different places than what LPs are used to. And mm -hmm. so LPs are encouraging GPs to be more active in the market. Yeah. I think that's why you'll see more buyer interest yeah. uh, in 2024 than 2023, and we're already seeing some of the green shoots around that. Yeah. I think what you'll also see is some pressure on, on private equity firms to sell assets that they've been holding on to so that they can return some of uh, those proceeds to their LPs. Is there any particular hotspots in the world, any regional location that we should be aware of in healthcare? Yeah, Gina, that's a good question. We have seen this steady rise over the last several years um, in healthcare deal activity in India. Massive population, right? Almost a billion and a half folks. Uh, rapidly increasing middle class that's looking for quality access to healthcare. And you see a lot of private entities that are stepping in to fund hospitals, uh, create clinics and you know create lots of different innovation for that massive consumer class if you want to call it that of, of healthcare consumers in India. India has actually become the largest uh, region within APAC from a deal perspective, which was not true for many years. Wow. For many years it was led by China, yeah. but over the last few years we've really seen the rise of India and, and very large deals now happening uh, in the Indian market. So we're very bullish over the next few years that you'll continue to see activity in India. Incredible, it, yet another India story, right? Yeah, it's been I the mean, story of the last year. Absolutely. I, I am curious though, as we get deeper into the year and we start to look at the potential for returns here, uh, are those returns gonna be completely dependent, I guess, just on those individual companies? Or does there need to be, uh, I guess, a little bit more government and regulatory help in terms of, I guess, creating an environment that allows those companies to flourish better? Yeah, a, a, yeah. a robust regulatory yeah. environment yeah. is critical to a well-functioning uh, capitalist society. And so we, you know, we think that uh, it's important to have uh, both of these things. If you look at returns uh, in healthcare private equity over the last 10 years, so deals that were done in the last 10 years, 97% of that deal value was created through top line growth and through multiple expansion or valuation. So there's a big question on, are you going to be able to continue to drive that level of top line growth? Are you going to continue to be able to have multiple expansion or are you going to need to do other things to create value within these companies? Mm -hmm. We obviously are biased as, as, as analysts of this market and as folks that are advising investors to say, you know, you want to make sure there's something real there, that you're creating some real value and not just relying on multiple expansion, because it may not be there for you in this next chapter of growth as it was for the last 10 years. All right. This was a great conversation. Uh, great to catch up with you. And it'll be interesting to see how the year plays out. Uh, we'll talk again soon, I'm sure. Uh, Nira Jane there is the co-lead of healthcare private equity over at Bain and Company. All right, coming up here on the break program, we're gonna set you up uh, for the big report tomorrow, a big monthly job support. Louise Shainer, senior fellow over at the Brookings Institute and the chair of the Bureau of Economic Analysis Advisory Committee. That's coming up next right here on The Close on Bloomberg.
the jobs report last month beat estimates. That is a stunning number. That is what nobody was expecting. The bullish train has left the station. This is what Powell does not want to see. This Friday, Tom, Jonathan, Lisa, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. You're really not seeing the level of restrictiveness show up yet in the labor market. Significant job growth and high labor force participation. There's a very strong chance that the market is mispriced for 2024. The December jobs report, Friday on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Welcome back to The Close. We'll have full coverage tomorrow morning, 8.30 a.m. Washington time of the monthly U.S. jobs report. But you get the full context and the expectations right now. Joining us now is an economist with a long list of accomplishments. Louise Shaner is a senior fellow at the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy over at the Brookings. She's also chair of the Bureau of Economic Analysis's Advisory Committee and a former senior economist with the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. Uh, Louise, great to see you here uh, on the program. Let's get right to it. I mean, this is a jobs report that, in all in all, probably won't show huge incremental changes here. But there has been a trend line that's being painted, and I'm not quite sure if that trend line is positive or negative. So first of all, thank you for having me. Happy New Year. And so, yeah, I think what we're looking for is continued slowdown um, in payroll gains, but hopefully not too drastic, right? So we have been getting data all in all between the jobs report and the inflation report that's pretty consistent with a soft landing, which is something we all hope for. Um, and so we're looking for data that ratifies that view that we're getting a soft landing. So jobs in the 150 to 200, maybe around 100, 175,000 range mm -hmm. um, would be consistent with this sort of gradual normalization of the labor market um, that would be consistent with saying, yes, we are getting that soft landing that we want. Does it matter where those jobs are coming from? I think back to the last couple of reports where we saw a very heavy weighting in government jobs and, and obviously a lot of the leisure and um, hospitality type jobs here. Does it matter that we're not seeing more broad based job growth? I mean, I think that part of what we're seeing in terms of these of these government and hospitality and leisure is this continued healing because those um, employment in those sectors are still below where they would have been um, without the pandemic. So it doesn't concern me that we're seeing the gr job growth most in those sectors. And in fact, the state and local sector was a real laggard um, and finally started raising pay and started hiring more. Um, and so I think, and they're also very big sectors in the economy. So it's not as if they're small little sectors of the economy that are getting, giving all the gr job growth. But we will look to see that eventually things normalize and that we see job growth sort of more broadly. Um, but no, I'm not worried about that. I think that's where you expect to see a lot of the growth. And the numbers that we're seeing are sort of bigger than we expect to see over the long run, given our population, right? So when we're talking about 150,000, that's not sustainable for many years, um, given our population growth. So it is still healing of the, mar of the labor market. So not a lot to worry about. Uh, it's certainly this week's data doesn't give us much to worry about either. We've got Challenger job cuts down 20%. You've got initial claims sitting at 200,000 down on the week. It doesn't seem like there's much to worry about, but there's got to be something that you're tracking that you want to see sort of continue to improve. Is there anything that you're truly worried about that we should be watching in tomorrow's report? I mean, it's not that I'm truly worried about anything. I think that I'm expecting good data that are consistent with this soft landing. But what we're going to be looking for, I think, is very much balanced risks, which is that we're looking about looking for we don't want a number too big, right? A number too big that says, you know, the economy has more oomph than we thought. Um, it would work, make us worried that maybe we're not going to get that soft landing, maybe that there's more impetus in the economy than we thought. That would make the Fed worried. That would make the Fed think, well, maybe I can't start cutting rates because there's just too much growth in the economy on the one hand. On the other hand, you know, if you look at today, the JOLTS reports from this week, um, they did show if you look at the level, quits are just below the, what they were pandemic, hiring is just below. But, you know, those have fallen quite quickly. And so I am worried about a little bit on the downside, which is like, what if the monetary policy tightening has been too much and that we start to see a more rapid slowing um, than is consistent with the soft landing that would suggest that maybe we went a little too far and that we are potentially headed for recession. That's not what I expect, but that's kind of what I'm looking for. One thing I always like to do when I look at the employment report is the segmentation and something we've been tracking a little bit is the part-time workers and where part-time workers are headed also industry work. So manufacturing versus consumer space, manufacturing versus services. What are you seeing when you segment the labor report right now? 
So as, as you mentioned that we're seeing that the industries that people are going into are the ones that are still the uh, industries that were lower than you would expect the payroll absent the pandemic. Um, so, and I, I don't think there's big stories necessarily on the part-time versus not. One of the things that I am looking at in particular um, is labor force participation and labor force participation by, by sort of demographics. So we've seen sort of stronger labor force participation than we would have expected pre-pandemic. And I think that's probably related to remote work, although it's kind of hard to tell, it's too soon to tell. Um, and so there you would look at people with disabilities, you would look at mothers with young children and to see if you're seeing that continued rise in labor force participation you know, I'm pretty sure remote work is going to boost labor force participation somewhat. I just don't know how much. Mm -hmm. And so that's something I'm looking at. And remember that we can afford to have big payroll numbers without worrying about inflation if we see uh, higher participation as well, because that just says that people are entering the labor market and supply is increasing at the same time as demand. And so you can see some big numbers without sort of any changes in the unemployment rate. So I'm very much looking at um, or to looking at participation and also so the share of foreign born workers in the in the um in the labor force because that has also been a, a sign of strength which is that we've had higher immigration higher supply that's allowed us to have this booming economy while inflation is still coming down so yeah. those are the things i'll be looking at I, um as well i am curious with regards to the foreign born workers louise have we seen a material change since uh, obviously what effectively was a closed door policy for a couple of years here in the u.s has it been significant Yes, it's definitely significant. Yeah. A lot of the rise in the labor force participation is in, in foreign-born workers. Now, we don't know when they arrive, so that the data in the CPS and the data set just say, where were you born? Um, but it has been significant, and we think that it is uh, because of higher immigration, which we think is continuing. Um, and so, the, and, and there's some stories about how it's now easier for people's spouses to get visas and, and therefore to be able to work um, so it's not just that there's more immigration, but that the immigrants are more likely to be in the labor force. Um, and so that has been a strong um, part of the story of increased labor force participation. So one thing that we have not yet talked about is earnings and the average hourly earnings numbers that come along with the employment report. What are you expecting to see there? And what do you think the Fed's going to be watching for with respect to earnings? Right. So the earnings story is one where, you know, in the long run, we think that to have inflation at target 2 percent, you want some wage growth of something like three and a half percent. Right. Because we think about inflation is wage growth minus productivity growth. Um, so we'll be hoping for wage growth. You know, if we saw a three and a half percent, that would be very consistent with us being at a 2 percent target. But maybe it'll be three, six, three, seven. Um, we're just hoping for uh, we don't want to see an acceleration in wage growth um, because that would make the Fed worry that, again, the economy wages are growing too fast. We're not going to be able to be, be able to sustain this lower inflation rate that we've seen over the past three to six months. All right, Louise, always uh, great to catch up with you. Always wonderful insights. Louise Shaner there. She's senior fellow in economic studies over at Brookings and chair uh, of the advisory committee at the Bureau of Economic Analysis, a long career in economics, including at the Treasury and the Fed. As we set you up, of course, for that big jobs report number, 8.30 a.m. Washington time. Team surveillance will be all over it. But stick with us here on the close, because when we come back after the break, we're going to set you up for some of the other big market moving events tomorrow. This is Bloomberg. been a busy week for a holiday shortened week here in U.S. equity markets and tomorrow might not be any less busy. A lot of economic data, a lot of folks uh, stuff that the markets will keep their eye on. And we start off overseas here. More inflation data coming out of the Eurozone, this time from Italy. Yeah, and inflation is still an issue. We have sort of dropped the ball on talking about inflation, which mm. makes me worry. Yeah. We're all talking about growth. We're all expecting a continued deceleration in growth and inflation. So yeah. I would say inflation could be a surprise for us. Yeah, I think a lot of folks have been trying to steer attention away from the inflation numbers and more to the labor market, yeah. at least here in the U.S., because that does appear like it could be a big driver of things. And we get a big monthly jobs report tomorrow morning. It could be, and it's suspiciously benign. Expectations are suspiciously benign. Mm, I, that's yeah. the best way I could describe it is everyone saying, ah, it could be a 
a pretty blah report, yeah. and usually that's a sign that we should be paying attention. Yeah, 175,000, that's the headline uh, estimate uh, that Bloomberg uh, got from its survey. That would be down from 199, but look at the wage growth, though. I mean, that's got to be a concern for the Fed here. While that's a some moderation from November, still... 3.9% yeah. year over year and even 0.3% month to month, that's still high. Still above that bogey that we were talking about with our last guest of three and a half being yeah. the general sweet spot that the mm -hmm. Fed looks for. It's a little bit too fast. Will it stay too fast is still a question mark. In addition to that jobs report, we are going to get U.S. economic data on the ISM front as well as on durable goods. Now, this is an interesting one because durable goods, we find, is actually very predictive of earnings for the S&P 500. Oh, yeah. And okay. if you want to isolate the exact number, it's non-defense orders cap excluding um, aircraft. Okay. So you look at capital goods, non-defense, ex-aircraft, and you get a really good solid series that could lead to earnings recovery in 2024. All right. Well, I'm going to definitely go back to my Bloomberg terminal <laughs> right now and look that up. But the big reason why we keep Gina Martin Adams around, some earnings tomorrow as well, out of Constellation Brands before the market opens. My thanks to Gina Martin Adams, our, our chief economist equity strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence for joining me today. Stick around. Balance of Power is coming up next year in the U.S. Have a great evening. This is Bloomberg.